Uh, good morning, members, and welcome to the first meeting of the year of the Communities Committee, which is uh, being live streamed and recorded. The recording will be made available on the Council website for public listening. Could I remind members to follow the good practice guidance, which includes muting the microphones and switching off their video when you are not addressing the meeting. Should you wish to contribute to any item, you should write speak in the Teams chat function and you will be invited to speak in order about new issues. Should your question or issue be raised by a previous speaker, please withdraw your request so that we deal with the business as efficiently as possible. The usual standing orders apply, including that any votes will be undertaken by roll call. If any member has to leave the meeting for any reason, can I remind you to either leave the Teams meeting for that period of time, or you could write leave in the Teams chat function and then join, which will allow us to monitor your members' presence. I'm delighted to say that our entry in the category of Stronger Communities has made it through to the finals of the Coslet Excellence Awards. The project Community Resilience Strengthened Through COVID is about the partnership working over the last two years between our Council and the great community resilience teams we have in the region. I'm sure we all wish the Community's Director Officers the very best as they make their presentations to the judging panel this morning. Mm -hmm. I look forward to hearing the result on the online awards ceremony on the 24th of February. Clear, um, we'll move to Cedarant apologies. Can you provide the Cedarant, please, indicating who's participating remotely and any apologies, please? Okay, thank you, Chair. Just a, one apology being indicated this morning from Councillor McGregor. For the benefit of those on teams, we have four members present in the Council Hall, being yourself, Chair, Vice Chair, Councillor Stitt, and Councillor Scobie. Currently, just the one member not present being Councillor Ronnie, all other members present on teams. Uh, thanks very much, Claire. I'm confirming that, uh, my agreement to the participation of the members named as part those participating remotely. Uh, I'd also like to advise members that I have agreed to receive an urgent exempt item of business on a proposed event, and it would be my intention to take the item at the end of the meeting under any other business. The report has been presented to this committee due to the time constraints of the event and cannot be delayed to a later meeting. Members should all have received a hard copy of, the, of that report. If, is, has anybody not received a, a copy? I'm, I'm taking that as yeah, a no. Chair. Sorry, who's Chair. coming in? Sorry, Chair. It's David Engels here. I don't seem to have a hard copy of that report. Okay, thanks very much, David. Um, what we'll do is we've got time because we're taking it at the end of normal business. We'll get an email copy sent to you. Okay, thank you, Chair. Anyone else? Yes, Chairman. Same position. Is that you, Ian, and Ian Blake? Sorry, I did put my hand up. I don't think it worked. Right. O okay, so it's in this, uh, so you don't have a hard copy either. You want one sent to you by email? Yes, email. Thank okay, you. thanks very much. Yeah, thanks, you know that. I'll do that. Uh, John? I've, uh, I've not got a copy on my part. It's just not showing up, even though I'm meant to receive exempt items. But I could use it. I could get it through for another few teams. Um, yeah, I was going to suggest, uh, uh, just get clear to email it. To you, Aye, well, I, can, I can get him. Oh, you, see, you've got, so I, don't you, know why, I don't know why, because I see set up for exempt items. But the yeah, exempt I, I think it's a wee glitch in the system, but I'm, I'm just I'm wanting to make sure this early so that we can remedy it, so that everybody's got a copy of, of that, what will be an exempt item. Is there anyone else? So I think, I think that's three you need, to, need a copy. Uh, clear. thanks very much. If you can arrange that, that'd be brilliant. Um, in that case, then, we'll move on to the... Uh, the agenda as it is. Any declarations of interest? Andrew? Uh, thank you, Chair. It's within item 12 as Chair of uh, Swest Strands. I think it would be best if I is opted out of that one. Um, that's that's your prerogative, Andrew. Are, are you saying that you're declaring interest and you won't take part yeah, in that debate? Thank, thank you very that much. Okay, that's fine, Andrew. Thank you. You got that clear. Anyone else? No. 
In that case, then, we'll move on to item number three, the minute of the meeting of the 7th of December. This minute is for approving. Um, are we happy to approve the minute? OK, I'm not seeing anybody uh, against it, so um, we'll take that minute as approved. Thank you. We'll move on to item four, Revenue Budget Monitoring Report for 21-22 for the period that ended the 31st of December 2021. The report provides members with the overview of the financial performance against budget for the period uh, up to the 31st of December last year. That's the end of quarter three for the Communities Directorate includes details of the continuing financial implications of COVID-19 emergency response and subsequent recovery. Uh, Carlene McQuiston's online and teams to help us. Um, Carlene, have you anything to add at this stage, or are you just ready to go to questions? Um, the only thing, Chair, I would add is that the Echo Deco plant, the MBT, has successfully reopened and is now processing waste. So that is the good news story. Um, it, it was slightly ahead of schedule. I think it was one week ahead of schedule. So that's um, that. That's the only news that I would want to impart at the moment. Thanks. Okay, so that's good news. Um, thanks very much. So have we any questions for Caroline? Um, I think, is that David Ingalls? Yeah, thank you, Chair. Quick question on page 28, uh, item 3.8, uh, it's regarding the money that's owed to the council by various uh, um, telephone providers, mobile phone providers. Can we get a wee bit of background on that? Uh, certainly, um, through you, Chair. Um, basically, in 2016, um, the uh, arrangements for the lease of a space on these hill sites to um to to um providers uh ctil and eel uh, came to an end these were being renegotiated unfortunately due to um uh, legal holdups, um, as there were three parties involved. Um, these negotiations have taken up quite a long time, but I see that Vlad has appeared on screen, so um, I don't know whether you want to add anything more to that. Yeah, Vlad, you like Yep, through you, Chair, thank you. Um, and also, I'm not sure if um, my colleague Harry's here uh, in order to speak to this particular point, uh, but in terms of uh, the legal uh, element of it, uh, uh, the, there's been uh, obviously bearing in mind that these are different sites and these sites have issues within them, whether it's, for example, uh, ascertaining ownership and thereafter uh, for us to uh, arrange for appropriate leasing uh, for ourselves and then thereafter the mast, but at the same time uh, also with the relevant providers and as an ongoing historic element of it, what we've had to do is uh, we're doing a, and we have been doing and, uh, and have done a full out assessment of all the sites, full out assessments of all the issues uh, and are addressing them uh, as we go uh, so that we can then set up the long term uh, contractual position uh, and in essence bottom this out in terms of the money's owed but also more importantly the future contractual arrangements uh, so that we have that uh, uniformly tied up uh, for all these sites but th there are a lot of complexities uh, in terms of the, the legal position in these uh, and hence it's taken a bit longer to uh, assess and thereafter action. So is it fair to say then, uh, Vlad, before Harry comes in, that it's a work in progress? And I, I see in the report there's a detailed report coming to the next committee in a month, just over a month's time. Is that right? That is the intention, as far as I know. OK, Harry, do you want in first before I let David come back in? Yeah, thanks, Chair, if, uh, if that's OK. Just to supplement what uh, Vlad has covered, certainly um, I think um, there has been constructive dialogue with all parties uh, concerned, uh, and just to assure members that uh, there is almost a daily um, dialogue between um, the operators, their legal 
representatives, etc. Um, and uh, the intention would be to consolidate all that information and bring it uh, in appropriate format to March's communities committee, because ultimately um, we want to ensure that uh, the income that we feel um, uh, can can be claimed by the council is, is received by the council. But uh, as Vlad has alluded to, the complexities of this and multiple landowners, multiple operators, their agents, etc. Um, unfortunately, it's not been possible to conclude it very, very quickly, but certainly we, we want to conclude it as quickly as, as possible and we'll, we'll be able to give a lot more detail um, at the next meeting of this committee. So hopefully that provides um, some reassurance. Thanks, Chair. Is that the answer you need, David? Yeah, it, it's just concerning. It's a considerable amount of money given the amount of savings we're going to have to make. And I know it's an estimated figure. Is it a fairly accurate estimate? And it seems to cover 10 radio helmet sites. Uh, how long has this been going on? Uh, Harry, can you give me some idea? You know, is it over a period of two or three years or five years? Or? Um, I'll let the director in. I'm just oh, sorry, acting chief. Sorry. Director today. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Chair, and thanks, Councillor Ingalls. I think what's the most important substantive point based on your comments would be is that uh, it's crucial that you know all members have been regularly updated on that. Uh, it features uh, in our accounts, and on that basis, I'm happy to provide a, a specific uh, briefing note setting out the background uh, and detailing uh, all the reports that have been uh, tabled on this matter. And obviously, we'll get a full report to the next meeting, which I look forward to. Thanks, Chairman. Yeah, thanks very much for that, Derek. Um, Harry, has uh, uh, Derek answered it for you? Yeah, nothing more to add. Thanks, Chair. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. OK, I look forward to that detailed briefing note because uh, I believe there's multiple users of multiple sites, so it's, a, it's the multiplier that I think is, the, is the, the big decisive factor here about why we kind of get a very, very speedy answer to this. So it's a, it's a long protracted negotiation or set of negotiations, I think is what Vlad's saying, David. Um, and obviously Derek, Derek will provide us all with a detailed breakdown of how this is going on. OK, he's happy with that. OK, appreciate that. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Andrew Wood. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, to ask on page 28, 3.7, the neighbourhood services, uh, you've got 110,000 that's uh, overspend on maintenance of the transport. A lot of that is actually down to pothole and poor road services uh, rather than them being old buses. And I wonder if there's some way that we can address that. The other one is on the governance and insurance in 3.9 and the underspend there. Um, I have a concern about the recruitment of staff and the vacancies. What actions are we taking to try and uh, you know, get that put back to normal? Um, Caroline, I'm not sure if you're able to answer that. Might need Vlad or, or uh, someone else to come in. And I see Harry's got his hand up as well. I'm um, going to let. I think Caroline, I'm going to let, let the lawyer I'll and let Harry. Heads of service answer those two questions then. <laughs> okay, so Vlad first and then Harry, yeah? Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, in terms of uh, 3.9, um, yeah, um, th there are, uh, first and foremost, um, just to recognise that there are vacancies, we, we have tried to recruit on a, a number of teams um, and um, we have been successful in some and unsuccessful in others. Uh, and this is, uh, as we know, this is a, a national picture in terms of uh, being able to recruit the, the, the staff that we require. Uh, however, uh, what I would uh, point to uh, very strongly is that we're carrying out an overall governance and assurance uh, infrastructure review in terms of the overall teams within governance and assurance. Uh, that will assist us in terms of identifying uh, what those pressures are within those particular vacancies and to see whether there's anything more innovative that we can do uh, to address that, whether that's uh, potentially uh, if we can't recruit to that uh, those particular roles, if we deem them appropriate, uh, we might look to external support, for example, or we might look at some other uh, out-the-box thinking in terms of maybe uh, looking at other local authorities and benchmarking there. So we're doing all of that, and that process is uh, in 
So we are starting already with democratic services and legal services specifically, uh, and then thereafter we'll move to the phase two, which will be um, the other teams within governance and assurance. So the assurance I would give is that we're on it, uh, we're prioritising that, uh, and absolutely we're, we're looking to make sure that we have the right infrastructure and the right people in place uh, to take that forward. Through yourself, Chair, I really appreciate Vlad's uh, response to that because it is a concern. We need to make sure that we get these vacancies filled where we possibly can because it's bound to have an impact on both our governance and our existing staff that's having to carry out the work. Um, I see Harry's wanting to come in, Chair. Yeah, I've got that. Harry, can you come in now, please? Yeah, thanks very much. Just to pick up on Councillor Wood's first point regarding um, the uh, uh, Council's uh, school bus fleet. I mean, I think looking at the the profile of, of the, the current fleet, certainly by far the majority of the um, reactive maintenance spend is on the older um, items of, of vehicles. Um, so we obviously have our cyclical um, planned preventative maintenance, but the majority of um, the, the, the spend that Carline details is for stuff that simply has to keep the wheels of the bus turning. Literally, um, the positive news is that uh, the council, um, through the, the due uh, process in terms of um, uh, the, the capital uh, investment strategy, has certainly recognised that and, uh, you know, pleased to report, as we've got on the, 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 uh, a later item, um, Andrew, that you've uh, declared an interest in relation to um, the investment in that fleet will, uh, we're very confident, reduce that uh, reactive maintenance, uh, which is also another positive side effect of that uh, of that investment. So hopefully that uh, clarifies the situation. Thanks very much. Chair, if I can just come back on Harry. I mean, I totally take on board what you're saying. However, it is an added pressure having a road network in the state it's in. And it's not just our school buses that are being affected, but also the commercial sector. They're also reporting high uh, you know, maintenance costs on all uh, ages of uh, vehicles. So I think it's something that we do really need to look at and, and try and find a way of addressing. But anyway, thank you, Harry, for that. I do appreciate what you've said. All right. Thank you, Andrew. Thanks, Chair. OK, um, I saw David Ingalls' hand back up. David, was that uh, historical? Uh, no, I, I actually took it back down, but it was really just a quick question on, on uh, page 33, the waste disposal at the Household Waste Recycling Centres and, and the cost involved in uh, doubling up the staff there. Are we in a position fairly soon where that can be reviewed? I, I take it, I know it's COVID, but I mean, are, is it crucial that we're still doing that? No. Uh, Chair, if I could... Um, okay, Stephen Herriot to come in there oh, if you need, uh, Carlene, yeah. Right. Uh, Stephen, do you want to uh, answer that one? Thank you. Thank you, Carlene. Thank you, Chair, uh, for bringing me in. Yes. In, in terms of the additional costs through the COVID period for uh, increased manning at the household waste recycling centres, we've, we've scaled that back. And uh, the anticipation is that we move into the new financial year without incurring those additional costs. Uh, and uh, that the, the resource level is back to the pre, pre COVID budgeted level. Uh, and we have been working towards that. Thank you. OK, David. Yeah, first class. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, Stephen. Thanks. Uh, any other questions for Caroline on financial matters? I mean, a wee bit of latitude there, but uh, it'll save us later, I would suggest. Uh, any questions? I'm not seeing any. In that case, then, I'm going to move to recommendations. So I'll be happy to agree the recommendations 2.1 and 2.2. Thank you very much. Um, We'll move on to item number five, the Welfare and Benefits COVID Impact Report. The report provides members with an update on the impact that COVID-19 has had on the Welfare and Benefits Services and other associated services. Again, we've got Paula Doherty and Lorna Campbell available in Teams to take any questions on this report. Um, have either of you got any update for us or are you happy to go to questions? happy to go to questions, Chair. Right, th thanks very much. Have we got questions then for either uh, Paula or Lorna?
Uh, Willie, yeah. Yes, again, uh, not from the author, but a depressing uh, report when you read, uh, you know, just how many people are, are having to access the various uh, funds, support funds that are uh, that we make available. Uh, I look at 3.2.2, and yesterday had a telephone call, you know, of a person asking, <coughs> and I believe that the council tax is under review, uh, and the effect that could have if the single person uh, reduction is affected in any way, unless it's uh, with a higher percentage uh, in that respect. And that's reflected in one of the case studies on page 64. It's really a question uh, around the 3.7.2, the current, uh, currently the WHO team of pre uh, predominantly funded from tackling poverty funds. I'm just wondering what the effect is going to be if we don't extend that uh, poverty fund, the anti-poverty fund. And I heard on the, uh, on the radio this morning, you know, that we're going to get an announcement today on fuel uh, charges, and it's something like uh, an average £1,300 will uh, rise to £2,000. People will not be able to afford this, and we're going to go further and further into uh, poverty in terms of all the, the funding sources that are available. I just wonder if we don't extend this, what could be the effect of that, uh, Paula, if you're able to uh, give us a projection <coughs> in any way? Um, well, two things for me straight away. You know, you can support which budget has got to actually continue this, I would suggest. That's a different matter altogether. But I think your question is, what would be the, what's the potential outcome if that is not supported? Is that the question? Um, uh, Paula or Lorna, can you give us a, a ballpark figure? Or, or is it something you'd have to work on and get back to us? I think I, I can take that answer. That for you, Chair. The... There's an appendix on the work of the Welfare and Housing Options team in its simplest terms. If they were not there, that would not be done. The processing of discretionary housing payments, the funds would still continue. Um, but if the officers were not there to help the customers, you would not see the results that are being presented. Um, if Lorna has anything else she wanted to add. OK, thanks very much. Um, that, uh, Pretty, pretty drastic, eh? pretty stark, eh, Willie. I think, you, you know, unless it's uh, something to add to it, yeah, I think we've got the message from you. Um, I've got uh, Jane Maitland now, please. Oh, thank you. Sorry, I was expecting uh, Councillor Blake, I think. Uh, uh, oh, sorry, Jane, yes, it is Ian first. Um, it's only just come up on my screen here because I can't see all the, the hands, so I'm relying on... Uh, um, getting it third hand from, from the governance officer. So, uh, apologies, Ian, it's you first. Yeah. No problem, Chair. Chairman. I, unfortunately, I lost the signal just as this item opened. So, my apologies if this has already been raised. It's a minor one. It appears just to be a, a, a typographical error in the recommendations. At 2 2, it refers to paragraph 352. I think it's 342. Can you just check that, thanks. You're quite correct. Apologies for that. Well spotted, Ian. Thank you. Um, is there any other question than that, Ian? No, that was it. Uh, thanks for spotting that. Thank you. Jane? Thank, thank you, Chairman. Um, it was on page 53, um, which is about the ward breakdown on the Scottish Welfare Fund. And I, I was just a little bit curious about the um, level of average award. Um, and I forgive me for being parochial, but that's the information in front of me. And I think I'm meant to be looking at it. Um, the, the Dean Glen Ken's average award seems to be an outlier. I wonder if you could just comment on how that particularly has happened. The, the crisis grants, Council Maitland? Um, it, Which it, appendix, Jane? I've got appendix three, page fifty-three, or on page fifty-three of our yep. committee papers, the average award 
appears to be eighty-three pounds. Mm-hmm. Do, do you see where I am now? Yes, yes. So it's crisis grants awards. The the average award is based on, or the award for a customer on a crisis grant is based on the, what they need at that time and their household makeup and the maximum we can provide them. Dee and Glen Ken's number of awards is lower because the demand in that area is lower. So it's affected more by skew for an average. So it might have been that this, you know a number of these customers had applied just before their next payment was due. So the value we would give them would be less and less applying just after they've been paid universal credit and being in crisis and needing you know, a high award. The level of award depends on the household makeup. So again, it could be that the D and Glen Ken's cases may have been children, um, no children or small families, um, whereas some of the areas might have been larger families and larger awards. But I can have a look into the details around the number of cases in that ward and, uh, and provide it to members at a later date. You okay with that, Jane? Yes, and thank you. And what you're saying about lack of children um, definitely chimes with, with the stewardry. Absolutely no question about that. Thank you. Yeah, I think just, Paula, if you can, just so we're absolutely clear, the, the awards vary, and this is a mean, um, yeah. an average, yes. So it all depends on that fam the particular family uh, circumstances um, as, as you take them into account as you go through the process. I think uh, you would explained that to me personally a few, yes. th few weeks ago. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? Uh, Ian, Ian Blake, I see your hands back up. Is that legacy? My apologies, legacy. Um, thanks very much, Ian. Uh, anyone else got anything for uh, Lana or, or Paula? No, I'm not seeing anything coming up. Um, uh, so, before I move to recommendations, I think once again, I mean, it's a fantastic report. It's uh, very well put together. We'll excuse the one typo. Um, uh, it's no like you. Um, and I just thank the team as usual. For, I have to say, as a ward councillor, the number of times I've had people using your service and come back extremely happy is... Uh, 100%, right? I've not had one single complaint about the way he's been dealt with, with the attitude and with the, the manner in which he's been dealt with. So if you could pass that on to the team, uh, or the teams, I'd be very appreciative. Thank you. Okay, so in that case then, we'll, we'll move to recommendations. I'd be happy to agree the recommendations 2.1 to 2.4. Okay, thank you, that's agreed. We'll move on, move on to item number six which is the goal management update. The report provides an update for members on the progress of the goal management activities and the outcomes and costs of the assessment of the four potential goal management actions which were outlined in the previous report to this committee in December 21. It is also my intention to discuss with members uh, the potential to add an additional recommendation about how we could best engage with the Scottish Government with a view to excluding a national way forward. Because um, I think everybody... Um, understands this is a national problem. It's not. A, it, it's not a Dumfries and Galloway problem. Um, I've got Sandra Hartness uh, on Teams uh, and Vlad's there uh, as well for, to answer any questions. Sandra, have you any update, or are you happy to go to questions? Thanks, Chair. No further updates, and happy to go to questions. Okay, so we'll go to questions. Uh, Jim Dempster. Thanks, Chair. Uh, so an excellent report from Sandra. I, with your indulgence and other members, I would want to change one word on, on the report, or change a couple of words, sorry, to introduce one word. The report regularly talks about buildings and properties, and I think it would be more appropriate to assets, and in that way, no matter whether it's a, a pond, a tree, a traffic light, or a building, it would be if it's our asset, if it's our responsibility, it should be included in the, the report, and that would make the report more comprehensive. The only other 
couple of points I would want to make is is that uh, maybe the engagement that, that Sandra suggests, if we ever get to that stage, could be a bit more comprehensive. I don't see any reference to working with the schools and pupils because in some towns and villages, kids manage to scatter food stuff, the length and breadth of the path between the supply chain or the supplier and the school. And although we can only speak for the police, I believe they have a role to play as well. And the only other daft observation, uh, our community wardens, maybe it should be all year round that they engage with people throwing away foodstuffs and feeding birds and no simply the gull breeding season because uh, there are other types of vermin that, that, that feed on that, that, that sort of discarded foodstuffs as well. So just minor observations, Jim. The only other throwaway line, if we agree all the recommendations on 315 and page 74, it talks about the need for gull-proof bins in a number of communities. I'm waiting on two defective ones being replaced as we speak. So there'll be an opportunity to try them out early if uh, the report is approved. And, and I would like, lastly, to record my thanks to Sandra and Laura for taking the time to start to investigate the issues that I, I raised with them. It's been really encouraging to see their commitment. So thanks for that, Chair. OK, so uh, if I'm picking you up right, yeah, we're talking about properties, we're talking about assets there, potentially. We'll, we'll leave that up for discussion with the, uh, the committee and then see what happens, Jim. OK, I've got, Thanks, I've got Willie first, then Pauline, and then Jane, in that order. Willie? Thanks, Chair. Uh, again, echo the, uh, the remarks made by Jim there in terms of it's a comprehensive report. Uh, and thanks, Sandra, for that. I know in it that the update on 34353637 are very much the advisory side in trying to promote and, and, and give advice and, uh, to as many, and I don't think anyone in this chamber would argue against any of those in terms of trying to get uh, the, the public aware of just what they could be doing uh, to help the situation. Uh, it's more to 3.15 that was reported at the last committee in terms of practical action. Uh, and again, Jim referred to it in terms of uh, bins up in Sinker, but I think they need, they're needed right across uh, the region, uh, as is identified in 3.15. So that would be at least a start in a practical way uh, that we start to look at this uh, and to provide these uh, gull bins so that the gulls can't uh, have no chance of attacking them, uh, the black bags and so forth, even at the cost of theirs. So that's a serious consideration we, we must give, and I hope that we agree that today. Uh, again, the net and the properties, uh, and this was something that, that was promised way back in Alistair Speedy days, uh, that we, we would net some of the, and I see John Luffin there, I don't know how effective, but uh, it, it's a chance for those that do suffer from uh, the problem of gulls, and I think it's something that we do need to look at. But alongside that, I think we need to look at it along with the RSLs, because they've got properties, uh, and that it's not just that the gulls go to local authority uh, roofs, they also go to, to the RSLs. So I, need, I think we need to explore that with, with the uh, social landlords, the registered social landlords, Lawburn, DGSP, and, and so forth. Uh, again, on, on 317, uh, it, it's the licensing to, to disperse of eggs, to, to take away eggs, and so forth and so on. I think if we try tie that into 3.9, uh, that refers to the research will be carried out during February 22 through focus groups. And if that was done area by area, that allows the public and, and, and the school children that, that, that Jimmy referred to there, if we could bring them into part of that whole focus group, so that the public are seeing that we're, we're serious about this and we're looking at different uh, ways of trying to tackle the, the, the problem. Uh, so I'd like to see that area by area in terms of those focus groups. Uh, so in the main uh, a report, I hope we can start 
immediately on the practical side uh, and people would see that we are doing something about it or at least we're trying to do what is a problem throughout the whole of the region. Thanks, Chair. Okay, th thanks, Willie. Sandra, is there anything you would need to answer, uh, to Councillor Scobie? I think um, most... thank, thank you, Chair. I've noted the points that Councillor Scobie has made, um, particularly regarding the bins. Um, I know that there have already been some bins rolled out, but um, with, if there's agreement today, we would um, certainly prioritise the problem areas first for the bins. Um, netting of properties, I've uh, noted the, the involvement of the RSL. Our um, environmental safety officer intends to work closely with property owners and um, RSLs are certainly a good example of, of where she could make a start with engagement and um, we could help the RSLs um, to, to progress matters um, with regard to um, applying for any licences that are required. The focus groups that um, Councillor Scobie mentioned, the, the ones that were mentioned in paragraph 3.9 in the report are actually from a Glasgow University student research perspective. But what we will do is learn from those focus groups and, and if they've been particularly successful and informative, we would seek to continue those and roll those out ourselves if we can do that. OK, Willie, thanks. Um, OK, so uh, <clears throat> I've got Pauline Drysdale, then Jane, then Andrew Wood in that order. Um, Pauline? Good morning, Chair. Good morning, members. Thank you very, very much, Sandra, for the report and also to Laura, because I know you've dedicated a lot of time to this after us pushing. I look forward to more engagement with constituents and businesses who are affected by the increase in gulls across our region since the pandemic. With regards to the support being offered, Sandra, to this is to residents and owners of non-council-owned properties, please can you clarify how exactly you'll communicate with them in order that they can attend the focus groups and do get help applying to nature.scot for the relevant licences in plenty of time. I know there's a dedicated email address, which you have kindly sent out to all the community councils now, but it's really, really important that this is cascaded down. Secondly, uh, sorry, yeah, because many, many of the residents are unaware of it at present. Secondly, can I ask if the council are communicating with DH, DGHP in order that they might assist their tenants accordingly? And thirdly, following up to Councillor Dempster's point, might I tentatively suggest that we look at implementing a temporary order to erect corrugated plastic, do not feed the gulls signs more prominently in the towns affected? Quite simply, we can't afford complacency at the moment. Thank you, Sandra. Thanks, Chair. OK, Sandra. Any comment? Uh, thank you to Councillor Drysdale. Um, yes, the, the focus groups, um, residents are probably not aware of those yet because I don't think the messages have gone out from the student. I think they're going out on gov.delivery and it will be this month, so they've possibly not gone out yet. Um, in terms of contacting other constituents, we do have a number of um, contact details of people who have previously complained. <clears throat> we can work through those. We are working through those in terms of our licensing. And um, members of the public are more than welcome to use the um, dedicated email address to contact us as well. Um, we have put a template for Do Not Feed the Gulls sign on the Council's website on the Gull Advice pages, which um, members of the public and businesses are welcome to download and use. But we will seek to have those made into signs as well and, and put those up in strategic places. OK, thank you. Um, are you OK thank with that, Pauline? Yeah, I am. Thank you very much, Chair. If I could just come back in, it's probably just to say, Sandra, I know that we have to have, a, I think it's a public order, is that correct? Excuse my ignorance on that, to actually erect them on lampposts or somewhere similar. We can't just put them willy-nilly about towns. There's, there are orders we have to put in place. We did do a campaign two years ago whereby we dropped off posters in shops, but they were very much lost. So if there was some way of just making sure that they're more prominent, I think going forward, we really need to look at doing that. But thank you very much indeed. And thanks, Chair. OK, thanks. Um, I, I take that as a statement, uh, uh, Pauline. Uh, OK, uh, I've got Andrew Wood now. Thank you, Chair. It was really just to ask, how closely are we working with other 
uh, councils who are being badly affected, the same as ourselves. And is there any possibility of putting together a joint action plan that we can present to the Scottish Parliament so, so that we can possibly extract some extra funding to assist us? Um, Vlad or, or Sandra, can you, uh, you've been benchmarking and we have had some contact with other authorities. Could you maybe fill us in or um, just uh, make Andrew acquainted with what exactly you have done up to date? Thanks, Chair. Um, we have been working closely with other authorities. The um, Environmental Safety Officer has actually been in touch with every single Scottish authority, even ones that we um, didn't expect to have gull problems just in case there, there were things that we were missing. She's picked up on some, particularly in the northeast of Scotland. There is a, a joint working group um, in the northeast that Maori Council, Aberdeen City, and Aberdeenshire. Um, have have joined together to um, to to share best practice and information. So we we've, we've tapped into that. We're using some of the resource that that they have. Um, we're learning from them, and um, we're we're gaining quite a lot of information from them. And we are in touch with other councils as well. So we are definitely benchmarking and trying to make use of the work that other councils have done. Okay, Andrew. Thank you very much, Chair. That was, uh, yeah, no, I appreciate that, Sandra. Thank you. Okay, uh, anyone else? Uh, David? David Ingalls? Yeah, just a, a quick one, Chair. This this issue with goals goes way back to the early 2000s, and it went to the Scottish Government at that point. I'm just wondering if there's anything that was learned from what happened after that process that we, we've, you know, what did we do then? I'm afraid it's too far back for me to remember. I, I wasn't involved in, in this at that time. So it'd be interesting to know whether we're duplicating stuff now that was done back then, or whether it was effective back then, or whether the, the, the processes that were taken now are different from what was proposed back then. I think it was David Mundell that was behind that when it went to Scottish Government. Um, okay, I'll let you just come in in a minute, Sandra, because we know that, that historical one, I think all the MPs and MSPs, um, Colin Smith was definitely in the back of that, and I think um, some of the, uh, the SA, I think it was cross-party actually, it wasn't just uh, uh, David Mundell. Uh, John, you want to come in? I uh, just coming in there, like, as I say, since I was elected in 2007, we seem to get this every year. The gold problems light, and I say I think it's a problem. It's never got to be solved. We had the conference. It was Mike Russell at the time. I think he was Environment Minister for the Scottish, or for Scottish Government, or something like that. Or he was a prospective. Uh, as Andy says, a lot of the MMP, MPs and MSPs were there, and I think Mike Russell was actually a prospective prospective MSP for the uh, got to be standing in this area. They had the conference at the Crichton. They've got to get sorted out. I don't think anything ever came of that. We've tried flying the hawks around about Dumfries and all we succeeded in doing was moving them further out, out with out to the likes of Locker Briggs, Georgetown and that. And we ended up getting more complaints about that. As I say, it's a problem we're never going to be we're never going to solve this problem like as well. As I say, I think it's never going to happen. The only way it would probably happen is if you could shoot every girl that was going about, but there again they would probably just move in. And I say and I just kinda as I say, they're not it used to be called seagulls, but now we're just gulls because they're just an urban menace now at times. So as I say, we've tried this and I quite agree, it's a, it's a national problem. The Scottish government should be taking a lead in this rather than the local councils. So, as I say, I think we should we should uh, try for a, either, I wouldn't say a conference would do much, but we should for definitely try and get some action for the Scottish Government on this gold problem. It's, an, it's taking place throughout the whole of Scotland. I don't even think it'll be Scotland, it'll be the whole of the UK, I'll be getting, I'll be getting gold problems like. But we've got to do, something has got to be done about it, but what, what we're going to do, I don't know, because we've tried everything, even in planning, I think Wally had said it. We, we actually passed that any new build should have gold-proof, uh, uh, gold-proof uh, on to, to, on it to move to make it harder for gulls to nest in properties. But there again, again, I just can't see how putting putting spikes etc. deterrents on the roof of council buildings are going to stop them going next door to 
be Jenny maybe stays in the house next door or something yeah. and I say and this has been a problem that's been going on for years as I say and I just don't know where we're going to get to the bottom of it um, Thanks D David I'll let you come back in in a minute because uh, I, I'm, I'm a wee bit older than John and I, th this isn't a 1980s or 1990s problem I remember getting my, my, my jam piece pinched off the beach at Spittle in the 1950s so um, it's it's been a uh, on the go a long time, let's say, as long as there's been gulls, gulls have been scavengers. Um, uh, any fisherman will tell you that at the back of the fishing boats. Um, it also ties in nicely with what I was saying earlier about we, I want to put another recommendation in there about how officers, we can, as a council, we can um, explore uh, with Scottish Government and any other partners, because there are a number of other agencies who might have to be involved um, to find a solution to what is, after all, a national problem, not just a Dumfries and Galloway one. Um, have, have you anything you want to come in with uh, is specific, or have you still got your hand up? Are you quite happy with that? No, I'm happy with that. I think, Chair, uh, I think it is going to be a really difficult one. We'll never eradicate it, but I think the steps we're going to take are probably going to, going to help. Probably public awareness should be a a, a big a, a big issue on this. I think people need to be aware that that you know you shouldn't be throwing chips out on the on the waterfront at the beach or whatever for for seagulls to come down and pick up. A, but I, I mean, how you would do that, I don't know. But certainly, I, I, I mean, I support the measures we're taking, especially with the gold-proof bins. If you sit in KFC or McDonald's or any of these places, I mean, the bins are are just emptied by the seagulls. Yeah. So, yeah, I think if we can get those people on board as well, it would be good. OK, thank you. I'm, I'm not seeing... There's another Harden going up. Can you see who that is, Claire? No, it's OK. I think the hand's disappeared. That's it. So I think that's all the questions. Um, so I'm going to move to recommendations now. Um, so are we happy to agree the recommendations 2.1 to 2.5? Okay, that's agreed. I'd like to add a 2.6, and that would be um, that officers engage with the Scottish Government and other agencies to explore a solution to what is, after all, a national problem. And that gives the officers the mandate to go away and speak to these people. Are we are happy to agree that? Um, yeah. Agreed. Chairman. Um, the, the other question, I'm not finished yet, Jim. Oh, sorry, uh, my it's sorry, Mike. It's all right. It's okay. I thought that would agree the word then. Um, no, it's the. Uh, well, I didn't get anybody else coming in to speak on that one. That's why I went with what was there, because nobody else came in to support. I'm happy to revisit that. And um, I've not got a problem with being council owned assets, if that's what you mean, because that would cover, would cover everything then. Um, we can't put that in for the non-council properties um, because we would just be opening the doors, I would suggest, to, to too much. So if everybody else has agreed, um, in 2.4, can we change a council-owned properties to council-owned assets? Um, I appreciate that, Chair, if you do that. Uh, Andrew, you're wanting back in. Uh, no, your hand's back down again. So is that everybody no, now, then? So, what about here? What about leave it was really just to support Jim in actual fact because we do need to look at the the other areas um because you know seagulls don't just land on the council properties so I, I'd be supportive of what Jim has uh, suggested uh, to, to clarify chairman yeah okay uh, come on I'm not wanting to debate about who's saying this and not in Sankar okay no no that wasn't a debate at all I was only going to agree with your a uh, assessment that it's own, I, my reference is only to council and properties. I don't know whether Andrew's supporting that or no. That was the only point I wanted to make. I wasn't meaning it should extend beyond that, and you already highlighted that, Chairman. I just wanted to clarify that my request was in line with what you suggested. I don't know whether that was what Andrew meant or no. Um, I, th I think so, because I'd, I'd had actually unanimous consent to change that to assets, so we didn't, well, I mean, we didn't need a motion. Chair, I'm in, I'm in agreement. There's no problem. Just I continue to go with the recommendations. OK, right, that's fine. And so that's the recommendation 2.4 as amended, council-owned assets, um, and then the rest, and then 
2.5 is okay, and then the 2.6 um, that I've already Claire's got there for the uh, for the minutes. We okay with that then? We can move on for goals. Thank you very much, everybody. Um, let's move on now to uh, item number seven: the headstones. Safety project across the Fries and Galloway. Uh, the report provides members with an update in relation to progress made to date in relation to the Memorial Headstone Safety Project and to provide options that can be used to make Headstone Memorial safe and in what circumstances these options might be applied. Um, I'd just like to remind members if we're going to, I don't want, this is a strategic document today and I think it would be sensible. If any members have got a specific issue about a specific cemetery, to contact Karen offline, okay, rather than take up community committee time on it. So, um, Karen, we've got Karen Brown here available on Teams to take any questions. Karen, have you any update for us, or are you happy to go to questions? Good morning, Chair. Good morning, members. Um, no further update, and happy to go straight to questions. Thank you. Thanks very much. Okay, so we're up to questions now. Um, uh, John Young. Thank you, Chair, and thank you for this report, Karen. Good morning, everybody. Um, I noticed in a local cemetery that a couple of headstones had been laying flat for safety reason, and I inquired who authorised this, and I was advised that it was a local monumental sculptor. So my question is, how many local experts do Dumfries and Galloway Council subcontract to carry out their, their safety checks and headstones, Karen? Is, is, is this a quite a common occurrence? Um, thank you, Councillor Young, and, and through yourself, Chair. Um, just to, to remind um, members that layer holders and, and owners are responsible for, for their own um, maintenance and repair and safety of their own layers, which includes includes the headstone. Um, currently, um, Dumfries and Galloway Council have got one contractor who we would um, utilise, um, who are uh, currently progressing the, the headstone safety project um, that the report is referring to. You okay, John? And can I come in again, Chair? And are, are we training our own staff to carry out these repairs, Karen? Uh, thank you, Councillor. Um, yes, some of our own staff have been trained, and we will continue to to, to train them over the the coming months and and years um, to and just to enable them to check when they're in then in the cemeteries and the burial grounds to enable them to to check the the, the safety of of the headstones. Thank you very much. Thank you. Jim, Jim Dempster. Uh, thanks, Chair. It's just a daft question because I'm sure it'll be, it'll, it'll be acceptable, but on page 84, on the fourth bullet point on 312, it talks about, the report talks about establishing a dedicated web page which will include ongoing work and where appropriate results and photos of work are undertaken. I I'm saying I take it, I presume it will be acceptable for local uh, individuals running local websites, Town of Sankar, to extract that information and circulate it more widely in the interest of, of, of just community and public engagement. I'm, I'm hoping that will be an acceptable thing because we are trying to disseminate this information as widely as possible. And the only other thing, I would say as uh, I would be disappointed if we didn't have records of layer owners, which is the bullet point above, because uh, we, we might have other requests for interments. We don't know how many years apart that might be. And I'm pleased to see that we'll link with other uh, organisations and individuals to try and establish that information if we don't have it. Thanks, Chair. Come. Thank you, Councillor Dempster, and, and through you, Chair. Um, so, in relation to to the web page that we're pulling together, that information um, will be will be placed in the public domain, um, and therefore the link will be available for for communities to to share on their own, you know, social media pages or, or Facebook pages. Um, and this, your second point in terms of um, layer 
owners and records. Um, there will be some um, Leonor owners that we, we, we don't know the owner of um, due to the age of those, those headstones um, and memorials. Um, and therefore, that would be the reason that we would then go and seek further information from local funeral directors or, or stonemasons or, or the local community. Delighted with that, Chair. That's what I'd hope would happen. And I'm sure that will be productive. Thank you. And thanks, Graham. OK, thanks, Graham. Um, I, I, in this order, I've got three speakers, uh, councillors want to come in. I've got Jane Maitland, uh, Andrew Wood, and then uh, I believe, or I saw Ronnie Tate's hand up. Has that been taken down? Is it? OK. He uh, uh, has got his hand up, yeah. Um, so in that order, I'll take Jane, uh, Andrew, and then Ronnie. Chairman, it was just a question about timetabling and whether or not our, um, you know, whether our um, policy would include um, limiting the time that we might have fencing around or the time that we allow an owner or a lair, uh, <clears throat> um, a lair um, owner to, to do something, to do the work. Because otherwise I can see that our, our cemeteries will be kind of littered with bits of rather um, unattractive looking fencing um, unless we have some sort of level of, um, of of way of of curtailing that. So I wonder what the proposal was. Uh, thank you, Councillor Maitland. And, and through yourself, um, Chair, um, as detailed um, on page 83, um, section 3.10 of the report that lists the, the remaining um, 16 cemeteries that, that require to be completed within this part or this phase um, of the Headstone um, project. Um, now, we have confirmed that this work um, I'm anticipating will be completed by the end of this calendar year, so December 2022, um, and therefore, um, the procedure that we've got in place is we will initially go in to inspect um, headstones and memorials um, where we find there are some unsafe. Um, we will mark those um, and give a two-month period um, for any lair holders to come forward or for us to, to make contact with lair holders, at which point we as a council, um, being the local authority, as we're, we're responsible for the safety within our, our, our cemeteries and headstones, we would then make them safe by using one of the methods um, within, um, within uh, the appendix, appendix one. I hope that, that answers your question, Councillor Maitland. Um, Chairman, forgive me, it doesn't totally. What I'm really getting at is that once we've put the fence around it and said this is unsafe, I mean, I can imagine this going on for sort of months and months. And it's a question of at what point do we simply say, um, right, we, we've done our best to investigate and, and, and the work is going to be done and there will be no more messing around with temporary fencing um, or bits of tape, and which is what we've got at the moment. It's really not very. Uh, it's not very attractive. Sorry, Councillor Maitland. So, um, as I say, we, we would have that two-month period. We would then go back in um, and and make those those headstones and memorials say have got a, a very long, um, and that period would would take a, a little bit longer. So, hence the reason we have got some headstones across across our region we, which do have. Um, Harris fencing around them. I would be looking to um, to uh, implement a time scale to to get those um, inspected and made safe um, within. I would suggest six months. However, that will be very much dependent on on the point of failure within within that headstone and what um, uh, technical expertise we we require to to make them safe. Okay, Jean. Thank you. Yeah, I, I think the problem here is it's almost like painting the fourth bridge, isn't it? Because once we get to one end, we've got to start over again and suggest we coming in uh, at times when things are, are, are really unsafe um, or evidently unsafe um, with that sort of routine maintenance programme. I think uh, this is going to be with us for a long, long time. Um, so, Andrew, do you want to come in now? <coughs> Thank you, Chair. And first of all, I'd actually like to compliment the oh yeah, Karen, sorry, on you know the, the, the papers itself. It does read very much like as though the government guidance has been read. However, I would like to ask on page 81, 3.2, 
What actions have been taken by our Council to meet the Health and Safety Act 1974 and Occupiers Liability Scotland Act 1960? Um, and further to that, if these actions had been taken, would this have prevented the alleged poor state of many headstones? Another point I'd like to bring up, if this is OK with yourself, Chair, and that is on page 84, 3.14, I would have liked to have seen an appendix evidencing how or what these accurate records will look like, showing past recorded examples. I think that elected members would have found that helpful. On page 85, 3.18, is this qualified person a member of staff and what qualification do they hold? How many years have they been doing these checks? And why have these problems not come to our attention before now? Then we have 3.21. The preferred approach being taken at present does not consider possible refixing and fault, or refixing of the, any fault or identifying outside funding for repairs. Now, the contractor, I understand, is MEMSAFE. I, I take it they're going to continue the work because I'm sure that Karen said that they were continuing with the same contractor. Why are we not considering a local contractor? And what qualifications do MEMSAFE have as they're not registered with NAM, which is the National Association of Memorial Masons, nor BRAM, which is a British Register of Memorial Masons. So if we could possibly get some answers to those was it four or five points, that'd be really helpful, Chair. Okay, can I come in uh, just before you answer, Karen? Andrew, that, you've asked them some really detailed questions there, and you're perfectly entitled to do so. My suggestion yes. is that we get Karen to actually uh, drop a briefing paper to answer your questions in detail, rather than ask her uh, at, uh, here in committee, you know, without having access to um, some information, uh, some records and stuff like that. Um, I would think that's probably a fairer way going forward. I do take your point, yep, yeah, I think your point's well made, but it would be helpful, I think, if, you, if we could give Karen the leeway to go away, research, and bring back a, 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 a very detailed briefing for the uh, for the members. Will you be comfortable yeah. with that? Well, Chair, with with, with respect, I, and I totally take on board. It is a, an awful lot to digest at one uh, one uh, time. But my concern is that Karen has already stated that she's going to carry on working with MemSafe. Now, from what I have seen, having they checked out MEMSAFE within their website state that they are registered with BRAM. And I would like to know what checks our officers are actually making on contractors. It's a, it, this is a real worry. And I have a lot of constituents who are deeply concerned at the way actions have been carried out to date. I don't want any further actions taken until I can be reassured, and I'm sure other elected members can be reassured, that this is being done properly, safely, and with, you know, uh, with people's emotions uh, given consideration. So, furthermore, is actually, Bernice Chair. Um, just a second. Of, yes, sorry. Sorry, um, whoever just cut in, can you stop cutting in, please? Um, Andrew? Yes. Uh, what I'm saying now is I'm, going, I'm asking the officer to give a detailed response and a detailed briefing because what you're asking for is not at her fingertips. Okay, so it's unfair on her at this moment in time, but she can go away, do the research, and then brief us all in, in, in great detail. And I think I'd be much happier that than asking Karen to just make this up. Well, not make it up, but actually just uh, recall well, it from memory. I hope it's not being made up, Claire. But thank you. No, I, I, will, I will accept uh, your points. Yep. And I'm happy to go with that at this stage. Uh, thanks very much, Andrew, for, the, for, for that. Uh, 
Hey, uh, now, so I'll move on now to Ronnie Tate. Thanks, Chair. Um, just uh, putting my construction cap on here on page 88. Uh, and this is just a suggestion to try and help things here. Um, it does state, it's on the, the sinking and trenching and socketing stuff. Uh, you know, you lift a memorial and uh, excavate in front. I, I would suggest to Carl, really, that some of these old stones will not have foundations in them. You know, so therefore it could go back into the same hole with a foundation put into it. And if you want to secure it quite, you know, uh, rigidly, you could either dull it or bracket it. But I would suggest a lot of these old headstones will not have foundations in them. So you could actually just put it back into the same hole that it came out of. That's um, just a suggestion, Chair. Uh, uh, Ronnie, th thanks very much for that. Uh, I can confirm that when the video that was made um, of the, the expert who gave evidence to the fatal accident inquiry, about the, the youngster who died in Settle, Scotland, um, he uh, was shown our local people and shown us how that trenching was to be done. And to the best of my knowledge, that what you're saying was actually what they, they, they did. Um, and it was mainly on older uh, uh, headstones. So um, your point's really well made, and I'm sure it won't be lost in Carn. Um, do you want to come back in, hey, Ronnie? Or Karen, have you any, no, any comments? Yeah, well, yeah, I, th I think actually, again, of all the suggestions and all the methods that we're talking about here, the trenching and socketing is the only way we should go, really. You know, the, because it, it's permanent, really, that's it. So I would say, in the long run, it would save money as well. Thanks, Chair. Yeah, thanks very much. Uh, um, David, uh, David Ingalls. Yeah, Chair, if you'll bear with me, it's just a slight aside here. Uh, highlighted a few meetings back, few committee, committee, committee meetings back, about the um, policy for purchase of burial layers, and I'm just wondering whether we can get a report on that fairly soon. Thanks, Chair. Um, I'll, I'll ask Karen if she can again uh, do a briefing for us and bring us up to speed uh, where we are with that. So Appreciate um, that. You, you okay to handle that, Karen? Yeah, thanks very much. No okay, um, I've not got any further speakers, um, so I'm moving to the recommendations. So I'll be happy to agree the recommendations 2.1 and 2.3, and also um, the recognition that the officer will be doing a detailed briefing to bring back to members. I would suggest all 43 members, Karen, rather than just the committee. Um, to keep uh, every councillor up, up, up to speed on what's happening. Is that, is that happy fair? To, happy to talk, Chair. No problem. Yeah. Okay. Thanks very much. Um, so, uh, th thanks very much, uh, Karen. Uh, we'll now move on to item number eight, which is the region-wide coastal benefit fund report by the community planning engagement manager. It invites members to note the information from a recent Scottish Government evaluation of the Scottish Crown Estate Marine Asset Net Revenue Funding and agree the process criteria and use of an out-of-sync allocation for 21-22. This is a very positive report for us to consider today. Um, firstly, as you can see from paragraph 3.3, .3, our Council's percentage allocation from the fund has increased following the first review of the fund by the Scottish Government. Um, so although we have not yet been advised of the future allocation as referenced in paragraph 3.6, we expect around 600k in the summer of this year and members of the new council will, will agree its use. The feedback from the members' seminar that took place in early January was support for a grant application process for the future funding. Secondly, in relation to paragraph 3.5, we have had confirmation from the Scottish Government that the request for an extension beyond the 31st of March 2022 to spend the monies has been agreed. The Government still would prefer the spend by 31st of March 2022, and it has given an extension to the end of the following financial year. This extension has been given to all councils. So our proposal to allocate monies by 31st of March 2022 and spend by the end of September fits in well with that timetable and ensures that our communities get over half a million pounds of improvements that they have identified in the, in the coming months. Uh, this timetable also means that many of these improvements will be in place for visitors over the summer, which will assist with the COVID recovery. As members will see in paragraph 3.12, this report was sent out to community councils and we've had a positive response from them as they see their community suggestions being acted on 
and they have also said they will be pleased to work with us about the detailed arrangements, for example, the location of benches, benches sorry, and the timing of toilet upgrades, etc. Uh, after all that, I've, um, I've got Derek uh, Hextall and Liz Manson available on Teams to take any questions. Derek, have you got any update um, on, on this report? Uh, Morning, Chairwoman members. No, no further update. Uh, I think the, the additional clarity we could provide there has covered the, the points of the base. Thank you. Sorry, OK, so we'll go to um, questions. Uh, uh, Ian Blake. Thank you, Chairman. I'm sorry for the delay. I couldn't find the button. The, uh, I attended the, the seminar uh, about this, and I was obviously a bit surprised when it came to light in January, uh, or late January, that we were get, getting this money. Even more surprised that we actually knew about it in November, uh, and this was really the first it came to members. Now, this is not a, a surprise to Liz or, or Derek. I, I did raise that at the time, that I thought it would have been appropriate that all groups should have been informed at the time, and not merely the, the chair and vice chair sometime in December. Uh, it is a significant amount of money. I'm, I'm delighted to hear that we've got an extension. The papers obviously didn't know that. But they were, uh, it wasn't in the papers, but the extension to next year certainly changes uh, the, the position totally. Looking at the, the suggestions that came forward uh, that are on Appendix 2, there are a number of these, I think, they're, they're actually contrary to the, the Scottish Government's policy and it has to be not current expenditure, it's, it has to be additional. Uh, and we're talking about public toilet refurbishments, which we should be doing anyway. Goldproof bins, which we are doing. Uh, and the, I mean, the list goes on with that. Uh, it includes the, the benches, which was one, that certainly I don't know that we've actually supplied benches for some time. Uh, so I suppose arguably we could maybe get away with that one. But I just I think I would like clarification the fact that we seem to be this if this goes through in its present format and we do agree the spending that's that's uh, put forward uh, in the appendix two, is this really an agreement with the Scottish government's criteria in this? I'm really keen, and I think that the, the, the this funding was meant for the, the public good, and I think given that we've got the years now to, to do it, we should it should be community-led projects, albeit we could be involved in it, uh, in it, but not actually leading in it, as this paper would suggest. Thank you. Um, OK, uh, apologies. Jackie McCammon actually had her ha uh, hand up first, but I'll come back to you in a minute, Jackie. Um, Derek or Liz, have you any comment to make to Councillor Blake? Yeah, I can maybe start off, Liz, and then uh, bring you in. Um, yes, uh, just to give you assurance that the, the proposals that are, are put forward in the paper were worked up by officers um, on the working with the, the Scottish Government guidance that we were looking to um, commit the, the funding by March. Um, whilst some of the, the activities may be planned by our council, um, the, the proposals that are put forward are certainly in addition to any work um, programme of works that are in place. And officers have been very careful to ensure um, that any of the, the proposals are in addition to any budgeted spend. So they are, uh, we are confident that the proposals that are within the appendix um, fit with the criteria that has been set by Scottish Government. Um, and in terms of the, your comment around the the previous allocations have been for the public good. Um, just again to give assurance that all of the proposals that have been put forward um, have been identified as priorities by our local communities as outlined within the report. And indeed, it would be the intention that a uh, future um, a delivery of the, the, the funding that's allocated by the Crown Estate could revert back to being open to a community led project. Um, Liz, I don't know if you want to cover the initial point. Uh, yes, thank you. And um, this is indeed the third allocation that we've had for this fund. So we followed the normal um, process, which is that um, when we've had the notification, we arrange a mem an all-member seminar and um, we brief the chair and vice chair about the arrangements that we're putting in place. So we, we did follow the, the normal process for that. And I think just to pick up on the point about the community um, grant process, 
that the member seminar were very supportive of that being used for the, the next allocation that we get. We don't know the timing of that um, and we don't know the amount, but we are expecting it to be in the summertime and we are expecting it to be around the 600,000 mark. As members will be aware, we haven't actually spent fully the first two allocations that we've had, um, and that was either that we didn't have um, enough compliant applications from third sector organisations, or indeed some of the projects weren't able to proceed and therefore the money was not claimed. So uh, you, you can be assured that officers will be working with coastal communities to make sure that when we do get to our next allocation, that we've got projects that are, are compliant and that are ready to be submitted and to be considered by the new council, should the new council decide to have again a community grant process. You'll, you'll see in the appendix, um, appendix one, that there's mixed practice across Scotland about some councils like ourselves have indeed gone for 100% community funding in the past, um, with some other councils doing 100%. They've called it central, but that basically means that the council um, it's been the council that has delivered the projects um, and some councils have had mixed approaches. So that will be something that, that we'd certainly see that the new council can consider um, when we get our next allocation. And again, it would be our intention, as we always do, to have a member seminar to discuss that with members before the appropriate uh, decision making body makes the, makes the final decision. Thank you. OK, Liz, thanks. Uh, are you OK with that, Andrew? Uh, sorry, Ian. <laughs> the, uh, yeah, I, I do. I'm, I'm not going to labour on the point. The, uh, I appreciate that Liz followed the, the usual process, uh, or Liz and Derek followed the usual process. I would say in this particular case, it was a bit unusual in that we got the additional money and it was very short notice. We had to spend it initially within four months. Now that that pressure's off, I'm not so sure we shouldn't be going ahead with the, the communities bidding into this process, as we do have an, a year's extension, and we'll consider that later on. Thanks. OK, thanks very much. Uh, I've got Jackie McCam and then Willie, and then Andrew Wood. Great. Thanks, Chair, um, and thanks to Derek and, and Liz for this report. Um, my, I'm just sitting thinking this morning, actually, when I'm reading the paper again, um, 3.7 um, with regards to underspend, surely we are, the, we must be the only authority in Scotland to ask for an extension to, to spend in this year's application. But um, in terms of the, the next year's allocation, I wonder, and certainly if it's possible, I'd like to propose um, that an emergency pot, funding pot um, is created. So, for example, what I mean um, is this would allow applications such as the community in, in Dromore um, for emergency repairs to the harbour wall after the storms um, and other such emergency events that, that um, communities face. Um, if we can't decide just now because we're not the new council, um, can I ask or certainly propose that some of the underspend is allocated to exactly that? Um, just two, two things, Jackie. I think both things you're asking for are business of the new council because the money we've got today is separate from the next tranche that's coming. So I think your points, uh, whilst well, I've got an agree, I, I, I agree with you to a great extent, that there is, there is a potential for ring fencing of that, that budget for certain things. Um, I, but I would suggest that's the business of the new council coming in because that's okay. not, not going to be with us until the summer. Um, and it's clearly not in this gift, uh, this committee to do that. So um, I, I didn't know why to jump in, Derek, and answer for you, but I think I think Jackie's accepting that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I think yeah. Just also just add about the underspend that there is a committee decision to carry that forward. Um, so I, I don't think that would be within the gift that they currently to, to agree that as well in those uh, additional circumstances. Okay. Thanks very much. Um, uh, okay with that, Jackie. Yeah, okay. I, know, I didn't wonder, Chair. Uh, uh, thanks very much. Uh, Willie? It's on the same subject, Chair, uh, uh, and I just wondered if we had any discretion uh, as a committee or, or, or the fund had any discretion to make retrospective uh, payment to funds like the damage cost at Dromoa uh, through the uh, recent storms. 
uh, and if we could use that underspend, notwithstanding that it has been uh, carried over, but there could be a case made because the, the, the work had to be done at Dromore. Uh, it couldn't it couldn't lie the way it was. It had to be done because of the extensive damage, and I just wondered if that this fund is appropriate and we had some discretion to use it on the. I, I think the problem is we've we've had to be very careful with the procurement rules here, um, and the underspend is is for the the last two years. Um, the last two tranches, maybe a better way of describing it. Um, I don't want to again answer for Derek here, but uh, I, I think that's a question for uh, when the next lot of money comes up, uh, you know, in the next council. And I'm no way prejudge the, the election, but maybe you can put that forward, Wally, you know. Can I maybe just get, uh, uh, take the point you're making there, Chair, but sometimes, yeah, procurements yeah, there but there can be contractual arrangements, and I think it was a contractual arrangement yeah. that, that, that uh, the repairs were, were done rather than having to wait till, till the, the, the next one. It's just a discretion. If we had that discretion and if we could use that in the case of or, or the, the damage, and it was severe at Dromoa. Um, I'll, I'll obviously let Liz and Derek in just in a second here, but... Uh, my understanding, this is going through a pretty stringent process to, to find out, and to try and unpick it today would knock it back. Um, and I, I, I take your point, and I take Jackie's point, um, and I think that's probably um, uh, for the next council. I would suggest, because we're only talking a few weeks away, really, aren't we? Um, uh, to, 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 to introduce another element into this just now is we'd have to go away and rethink it and it would just knock back the whole process. Um, uh, Derek or Liz, have you got any, any comment on that? Uh, the only point I would make, Chair, around the underspend is we would be reflecting on the current criteria and guidance that would be in place and uh, members did previously agree that anything that was committed to or paid for prior to a decision would be ineligible and therefore the, the particular project at Drummore would probably fall within that category. Ultimately, it would be for members to then um, read it, you know, uh, consider updates to that criteria and guidance, but that would mean a delay to the process and ultimately we'd need to open up the, the application process um, as well. Uh, yeah, I, th I think that's. I think it's a good try by Willie and, and Jackie, but uh, um, we'll, we'll move on from here. I've got Andrew Wood yeah. and then David, David Ingalls. <coughs> Thank you, Chair. Uh, yeah, good report. I have uh, no real issue. Just wanted clarification on, on the eligibility criteria. Is it to do with title and sea view? Through you, Chair. Through you, Chair. Um, Derek, the are you coming in? Here. Yeah, the community councils that were identified were those who have got a land border with the coast, and these were agreed at a previous communities committee. No, that that's fine. It's just if it was a sea view, I would like to put in Keir, Tinran and Penn Punt. If you go to Mull Hill, you get a beautiful view of Southern S. Uh, very, very good. Um, I just remember the same Andrew, you were part of the administration that agreed that, but never mind, that's another story for another day. Um, uh, uh, David Ingalls? Yeah, thank you, Chair. Uh, it's item 3.7 on page 94 again. <clears throat> I spoke to a number of third sector organisations who really weren't aware of this fund or or didn't think that they would be able to, to bid into this. Now, it says there will need to be promotional and support work with third sector organisations. Firstly, what promotional work are we going to do, given that this is the third time this this uh, fund has been, been put out there, to make people aware that, that you know, there may be there may be some sort of project that they can they can they can drum up, that they can tap in to get some support for. And secondly, the third sector organisations, exactly what do you mean by support for third sector organisations? Uh, how does a third sector organisation go about tapping into that support to be able to, to uh, support their applications? Okay, David, again, I'll let, I'll let the two officers come in. But just to absolutely clear, what we're discussing today is this, uh, this out of sync award from Scottish Government and the other amount we've been talking about is the one that will be available 
in June, about there sometime, um, which is the normal round. So we've got this money we need to look at just now. We've got some timescales. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll let Derek come in. I, I, I hope I've explained it so that we're talking about the same thing here, because the underspends are getting carried forward to the June amount, if I'm right. Is that correct, yeah. Derek? Yes, Chair, um, but just to give assurance in future rounds, uh, we would look to, to work closer, you know, throughout the pandemic, we've worked very closely with our community planning partners um, and those who are working at operational ward level as well. And obviously through the, the work we've done around developing proposals for this paper, uh, working with close, closer with colleagues across the region who are in, involved with third sector organisation as well as the ward working team, the ward assistants, our partners at third sector Dumfries and Galloway, who have got um, engagement officers across the region and also a dedicated funding officer. So through those supports um, and through our support to community councils and development trusts and various other third sector organisations, we will look to um, improve the promotion of the eligibility. And, the, and now we've, we've delivered the, the scheme for at least two years. We've got example projects that we can use as well. To, to promote that uh, as as how we can we can use this fund um, to benefit our coastal communities. Okay, David, you happy with that? Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Fine. Thank you, Chair. Uh, no problem. Okay. Is there anybody else uh, uh, want to speak? Well, in that case, I'm going to move to recommendations. I'm going to. Uh, are we happy to two point one to note? 2.2 to note, 2.3 to note, 2.4 agree the criteria for use of this out of sync allocation, and then 2.5 agree the allocations to community priorities at 3.1, and I'm happy to move that. Happy to second it, I agree with it. The, the, the chair's happy to second, the uh, vice chair's happy to second uh, for the record. Uh, any dissent? Okay then, in that case, it's a, to get into <laughs> I was kind of wondering where you were, Ian, so um, that's where. Do you want to come in, Ian Blake? Yes, uh, I do. Uh, with reference to recommendations, I've no difficulty with 212223, uh, but 24, I feel that given the extended time scale, that we should now revert back to consulting with the communities and opening for bidding. I would like to move that. You got a seconder? Yeah, I'll second that. The motion was from me, seconded by the vice chair, that we go with the recommendations. The amendment is by Ian Blake, seconded by David Engels. David Engels. I'll just wait for the clerk to catch up, and then we'll go to the vote. Okay. Are you ready to maybe just explain what the what the motion is and what the amendment is, and then we'll go to the vote. Okay, th thank you, Chair. I th believe there's agreement on recommendations 2.1, 2.2, 2 and 2.3. So the vote is about recommendations 2.4 and 2.5. The motion would be to agree 2.4 and 2.5 as they are in the papers. The amendment would be a new 2.4. That would be to agree back, agree back to the grant application process, the usual grant application process um, for for this fund, as agreed by this, this committee previously. Okay. So the motion is proposed by the chair, seconded by the vice chair. The amendment proposed by Councillor Blake, seconded by Councillor Ingalls. So, going to the vote then, Chair. Uh, motion. Vice Chair. Motion. Councillor Blake. Amendment. Councillor Campbell. Motion. Councillor Davidson. Motion. 
Councillor Dempster. Motion. Councillor Drysdale. Amendment. Councillor Heavy. Motion. Councillor Ingalls. Amendment. Councillor Little. Motion. Councillor McCammon. Amendment. Councillor Maitland. Motion. Councillor Marshall. Motion. Councillor Scobie. Motion. Councillor Stitt. Motion. Councillor Tate. Amendment. Councillor Wilson. Councillor Wilson. Okay. Councillor Wood indicated he was leaving. I'll just double check. Councillor Wood. And Councillor Young. Motion. I'll just double check, Councillor Wilson. Oh, not currently present. Okay, so the The motion is carried 12 votes to 5. Uh, thanks very much, Claire. So that mo uh, the motion is carried. So 2.4 stands as per the committee papers. Um, and then we move to 2.5, agree the allocation of committee priorities. Um, uh, there was no opposition to that. Uh, well, that, that, wasn't, that depended on 2.4, didn't it? So are we now agreeing to the allocations to committee priorities? Um, as set out at 2.5. Okay, thanks very much. That's agreed. Um, in that case, then we'll move on to item number nine, which is the community facilities review update. Uh, provides members with an up to date position in relation to the community facilities review. Um, and I understand that uh, we're going to get an update, a verbal update on uh, Kirkham Hall. Uh, Karen is available again in Teams to take any questions. Uh, Karen, can you give us your update, please? Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, as detailed in Section 3.4, um, we anticipated a meeting with our Community Council um, last week. Unfortunately, that did happen um, and is due to take place next week, but I'm happy to provide members an update following that meeting. Okay, sorry, it, it didn't make, wasn't very clear there, Karen. What, did, what was the update? Sorry, Chair, um, there was a little bit of uh, um, uh, interference through there. Um, unfortunately, the anticipated meeting that we were due to have with Commun Kirkham Community Council um, didn't happen last week and is due to happen next week. Um, so following that meeting, I'd be more than happy to provide members with an update. Okay, so are we doing that? Um, verb are we doing that by a briefing, or are we um, bringing someone back to the March committee? Wh which one is, is best? Uh, happy to provide a briefing, Chair. Okay, uh, uh, yeah, as long as members are happy with the briefing, yep. Yeah, I don't see any dissent to that. Um, so thanks very much. So uh, are we ready to move to questions now? Any questions for Karen? Uh, Willie? Yeah, and uh, thank Karen for that, that update on, on the Kirkham Hall and, and Karen does keep us in touch as ward members with what's happening uh, uh, in, in all the halls uh, in Ward 1 at least. Uh, I'm just noting in, in uh, another part of the report uh, in terms of the Port Patrick Hall uh, and I would hope uh, from the report that's before us that there has been an interest shown by two groups that we can start to, to perhaps bring the community together. 
uh, and uh, around the hall and that we uh, move this forward as quickly as possible in terms of the community asset transfer. Uh, if there is an interest being shown, then I think we should put our efforts in to try and, and uh, bring this about uh, and working with the whole community, uh, if that is at all possible. Karen. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you, Councillor Scobie. Um, yeah, as detailed within 3.18 of the of the report, we have received two expressions of interest um, from two um, organisations who are, are um, keen um, to manage the facility on a short term basis. So that's a, a one to two year um, short term management agreement. Um, Officers will uh, work with both organisations um, to, um, with a view to, to them collaboratively working together um, to manage manage the whole um, in the future. Um, and I just want to, to confirm this is for a short term agreement. Any future um, longer term agreements or, or asset transfers would go through the, the normal CAP process. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much, Karen. Um, are you OK with that, Willie? Yeah. OK, thank you. Uh, just one thing I was going to ask you, Karen, see the briefing you're going to prepare um, about could come. Could you include all the, the Wickenshire councillors um, as well as the committee um, to make sure uh, if, if this crops up um, in area committee business, for example, they all know about it? Can you just include them in, in the mailing list? OK, thanks very yes, much. Happy I see to do so. Yeah, yeah, I see you're nodding. Thank you very much. Um, have I, I haven't got anybody else uh, want to speak at this, so I'm happy to go to the uh, recommendations. Are we happy to agree recommendations 2.1 to 2.4? Agreed. Thank you very much. Um, now we move on to item 10. Um, and I've lost my notes. Right, here, sorry. Um, so it's developing the Defries and Galloway parking strategy and decriminalised parking enforcement feasibility study. Uh, the a report about head of roads and infrastructure. Uh, report seeks members' agreement to the next steps in the Defries and Galloway parking strategy and decriminalised parking or DPE enforcement uh, feasibility study. Uh, I've got Tony Topping and Mike Fox available through Teams to, to take any questions on the report. Um, Tony or Mike, have you any update for us or are you happy just to go to questions? Thanks, Chair. Um, more than happy just to go to questions. Uh, thanks very much for, uh, for that, Mike. Uh, I've got Ian Howie in first. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, Mike, Tony, the implications of our relationship with the public in taking on the role of parking enforcement, it, it's such that there merit more scrutiny than can be afforded by two member sessions. I believe that members should be involved in this programme from the outset and would welcome your suggestions as how we can be embedded in the programme from the outset. Um, is, is that a commendation of the whole process, Ian, I think, is what, you, uh, if I'm picking you up right, am I correct? That's correct, Chair. Thank you, that's appreciated, and uh, I'm sure we'll pass on thanks to everybody uh, involved. Uh, Ian Blake. Yep, just very briefly, I'm delighted to see this finally on the table. I think it's long overdue. Our town centres are a mess with indiscriminate parking, and we really need to do something about it. Uh, I, I realise it's a consultation. I hope the consultation is going to be open uh, in that, that all aspects of parking are considered. I'm not suggesting for one minute that we will start charging in, in car parks, uh, but I think it's, say, or fining people in car parks, but I think it's, it's got to be part of the process and that we don't tie any future uh, Council to to a restricted view. I think it should be an open uh, view on this. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much, Ian. I think it's well made your, your point, but this will this will stretch into the next next council anyway. So um, the, the the outcome won't be by this by this council per se. So um, uh, either uh, Tony or, or Mike, have you any comment for for Councillor Blake? I think basically it's, yeah. it's support, isn't it? You, you've had Mike. Um, yeah, do you want to come in? Thanks, Chair. Um, yeah, really appreciate the, the positive comments um, from members so far. Um, 
I think the, the, there is a, a huge degree of confidence that this will be a very uh, robust and, and all-encompassing process. Uh, thanks. I think that's what Ian, uh, the two Ians were looking for and uh, commending you the way you're taking it forward so far. Uh, Vice Chair? It's just, uh, just a quick question here in uh, parking. In parking like, we put the charging points, the replacement charging points in the car park beside the Lorburn Hall there, and there's quite a lot of them, but we've actually done away with disabled parking spaces. Will they be getting put back? yourself, Chair. I'll maybe ask Tony just to uh, update us on that one. Uh, just go ahead, Tony. Thanks, Chair. Yeah, I think that that's something that we're, we're looking into. I think that the priority for these EV charging points was that there's obviously money coming from the Scottish Government, and in the first instance, it was to try and get these charging points in. Um, I will be having some um, consultation with our, our, our fleet uh, colleagues to, to see what the proposals were for the, the alternatives for um, disabled parking. Obviously, the disabled parking for the town will be considered as the whole parking strategy um, uh, anyway. But yeah, I think I think you're right. In, in, the, in the meantime, any, any loss of the disabled spaces, we'll, 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 we'll look into that and, and, and take appropriate action. And if there's other places where we can replace them, then we'll, we'll do so. Thanks. Yeah, thanks. OK, John, you went back in? Oh, sorry, that's fine, but uh, these spaces were taken away, and what we're saying is will there be parking spaces for, uh, for disabled, because disabled will have uh, electric cars as well as uh, able-bodied. I'm, I'm wondering, uh, we've, we've got the officer, I see Gordon's there, that's what I was just going to yeah. say, because... Uh, um, Maybe Gordon can come in with that answer to that one. Yeah, thank you, Chair, and through yourself. Um, we're, when, we're, when we're putting out the EV charging um, spaces, we're, we're working quite closely with, with Mike Grunwell. Um, so every every car park that we're working in, we're working to a ratio of one disabled EV charging space um, in 10. So that, that takes us above the minimum requirement there. Um, and any certainly any disabled space that's that's taken away, we're, we're putting back in somewhere else. So, but we're finding ourselves in the position where we've got disabled um, spaces for normal disabled users or parking, and then we've also got um, EV charging disabled uh, bays. So, we've actually got got more than we, than we should have. Uh, Chair, hopefully that answers the question. I only caught the back end of the, of the last question. I never heard the first bit. Okay, John, happy with that? Aye, that's fine. Okay, thank you. Um, I've got Willie, then Tracy Little, then Jane Maitland, in that order. Thanks, Chair. I think they used to be called traffic wardens we had, and the, the, there was no indiscriminate parking, uh, but we'd done away with those. So uh, I was you know, interested to see that in 3.6. It does say that Police Scotland manage. I think that depends on the priority uh, of parking in town centres in terms of uh, when uh, police respond, if they do respond to parking issues. So we have got a, a difficulty in town centres that has been well raised, uh, I think, throughout the whole of the region again. Uh, but local members uh, have been approached by businesses and, 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 and others that they just can't get near their properties and so forth. I, I'm looking at this and, and Mike and I has had uh, numerous uh, exchange of emails in terms of lorry and overnight parking and I'm looking at 3.25 and it's a gathering information for the feasibility study for DPE and the uh, parking strategy. What is the sort of time scale, Mike, and, and, and when can we see the, the car park and the, the car parks being regulated so they're not being taken up by lorry parking or overnight parking uh, by mobile homes and so forth? You got an answer? Yes. 
sorry, Chair, three years up. I'll, I'll maybe ask Tony to provide some assistance with the answer to this one because I, I know that he's been actively looking at the procurement as well for um, external assistance with the, the parking strategy work. Yeah, thanks, Mike. Thanks, Chair. Um, yes, the, the, the whole DPE process can, can take um, a bit of time. There's a 10-step process you've got to go through with Transport Scotland, um, and it, it involves an application to Scottish ministers for them to review and sort of authorise. Obviously, as, as part of the whole DPE process, there will be consultation with, with Police Scotland for us to establish exactly what powers we're, we're seeking to, to, to take on board and take take away from Police Scotland. Um, so um, as, as well as the whole application process, we obviously want to do the, the, the sort of consultation and engagement with obviously members and um, the, the public as part of the parking strategy. So that, that's again one of the reasons why we're doing this sort of holistic approach to parking over the, over the next sort of 12 months that we're, we're, we're looking at the strategy, we're looking at um, issues on, on the main political agenda, everything from climate change, active travel, electric vehicles, that sort of thing. So that, that this whole study, we, we, need, we need a bit of time to, to, to obviously to get our uh, external specialist in place and then taking it forward, I would hope to think we'll, we'll make a decision on DPE later this year and then hopefully roll that out for implementation maybe at the start of next year. You okay, Wally? Chair, just to come back uh, and what Tony was saying, I'm appreciating that there could be a 10-part process or a 10-point process to work through, uh, and that's for DPE. What I'm looking at then, again, we split this out in terms of DPE and car parking uh, or uh, parking strategy, particularly car parking uh, strategy where well, we've got car parks and, and, and we're seeing uh, continual oh. complaints of uh, lorries parking uh, yep. in, in car parks. And I, I thought we were near the point of, of resolving that uh, without being parochial in terms of uh, the, the, the use of the current car parks so that the uh, lorries and, and so forth could find, uh, or we have recognised the identified <laughs> lorry parks uh, as well. Uh, who wants to pick that up? Thanks, Chair. If I can maybe just come in there. I, I think Councillor Scobie is certainly referring to the, the work that we've been uh, undertaking on the uh, what's te termed the, the old various car parks order, which covered a variety of car parks within Dumfries and Galloway. Um, this has been a fairly extensive piece of work that's been uh, ongoing for, for several months now. Uh, and the, there's been quite a, a quite a lot of progress, actually, uh, in relation to getting to this to the point that um, we're uh, undertaking internal consultation um, with stakeholders with a view that um, potentially, timescale-wise, that we, we could have this out for um, external uh, advert probably in early spring. So we're, we're not far away from actually um, getting that out there. The, the issue then becomes the, that one of the stages of the process, it's actually open to a period, but um, that's part of the, the statutory consultation process. Okay, thanks, Mike. I'm, I'm getting a thumbs up for the, for the for you, uh, Councillor Scobie. Um, I'm, I'm now going to move on to who have we got? A uh, uh, the Provost, please. Thank you, Chair. And first of all, I apologise if I dip in and out. My Wi-Fi has been absolutely shocking these past couple of days. So in the meeting itself, I keep losing a few words. Um, it's it's kind of a similar-ish point to Councillor Scobie, but it's regarding the electric charging spaces in in car parks, um, it, it's kind of the same, I've kind of noticed at the same place as Councillor Martin was talking about at Lord Burn Hall. Um, what's the situation with non-electric vehicles parking in the electric bays? Um, are we using a holistic approach to that at the moment? Is it not actually in place yet? 
to if there's going to be any enforcement um, and if that's the case how are we communicating this with the public thank you do you take this mic or is uh, yeah, Gordon's coming back in to take this I think is he you could take this Gordon yeah, I can take this one if that's all right, Mike and Tony. Um, through yourself, Chair. So, the, in as regards to enforcement for um, non-electric vehicles parking and electric vehicle bays, and um, that that's still so. The first thing is we are we're working with a legal team at the moment, um, as regards to the TROs to see how that gets that gets built into the to the TROs, um, how that enforcement uh, will will come about in the future is through the back office of the actual charging units. Um, so the charging unit will recognise that, that a vehicle has, has, has charged its capacity, it's overstayed its visit, and then charges would be applied uh, to that to that vehicle um, via the, the, the normal way that you, you would pay for your charging. Um, that, that's not available yet. It's still being set up in the back office by the, the supplier. Um, which is Swarco, they, they operate the network for, for the Scottish Government. So it's still a work in progress. Um, there's nothing really to tell the, the public at the moment because it's not in place, but when it is in place, it'll be well signed, um, as is the, the, the charges that are applied to the tariffs and, and so on. So hopefully that answers the question, Councillor. You OK with that, Tracy? Can I come back in just a little bit? It's a little bit chair, please. Uh, yeah, of course um, you can. Um, so when this is all um, in place and it's all up and running, will these charging points be able to identify a non-electrical vehicle just sitting there without being plugged into anything? You're saying that it will um, be able to identify if they've overdone their time and they're still sitting there taking up that space. But if, you, if someone who's um, in a non-electric vehicle, will that be the process that we use for them to identify that or is that where we'll use our wardens? Yeah, apologies, councillor. No, that, that's where we would need to use our, our wardens. That would be physical identification of, of, of the cars being in there when they shouldn't be. Um, but again, that, that's something that we need to, to write into the TROs. That's, that's what we're just crossing off the legal at the moment, how we would do that. OK, Provost. That's lovely. Thanks very much. OK, thank you. In, in order, I've got Jane, Pauline and Jackie. Um, uh, uh, Jane? That, thank you, Chairman. Um, I, I think you probably gather the level of interest that this is um, <laughs> evincing from members already, that um, it, it's going to be quite a, a tough nut to crack, I suspect. I think this will be um, quite a long, drawn-out process. I want to go back to um, Councillor Howie's question, really, which was about the best way for members to um, to engage properly on, on, on this system. Um, it's not entirely clear to me um, that we can have both a regional policy and take into account very local um, uh, circumstances and idiosyncrasies. Um, a town close to my heart has parking which would make, I think probably, most officers weep if they were given it to start with. Um, and um, I, I know that there are going to be real problems with communities. Um, so there are two ways of looking at this. Um, we have set up in the past, we've set up a, um, a subcommittee to deal with um, waste, for example, um, and, and go through issues so that members are absolutely cited on what is happening and, um, and can talk to their, their groups. Um, and we've also had member officer working groups, which is a much more um, informal arrangement. Um, I'm, I'm very happy to take advice, governance advice, as to the best way of achieving member input at the earliest possible stage. Because if you come along, um, you know, 18 months later, um, you might well find that people are not properly engaged. And, um, and bring things which can knock this off, of course. So um, if I could have some advice, please, as to what we should be doing with respect to um, member involvement, that would be helpful. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll just let Mike in, uh, Jane, but I see the appendix for the consultation mandate and authorisation is to have the, the whole thing done and dusted by the 31st of March 23, which is just over a year now from now. Um, 
and 317, is it? Um, in a, the Council's participation in the engagement strategy, we are included in that as councillors. So but I'll let Mike come in or, or Tony come in. Thanks, Chair. Again, happy to take advice here that um, whatever is... I think he's frozen uh, uh, consistently to this process. Um, uh, Mike, uh, you, sorry, my connection you, seems you to disappear. There. Um, we, we didn't hear what you said. Can you repeat it, please? Can you hear me now, Chair? Yes, I can. That's fine. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think. What I would just to, to reiterate was that I'm, I'm happy to take advice um, to ensure that, that members are, are fully engaged and uh, updated and informed throughout this whole process, uh, whatever form that, that needs to take, really. Yeah, I'm assuming that'll be through the engagement process that's, that's outlined in the paper. Yep. Um, let, I see Liz has come on, uh, our engagement guru. Right. OK, Liz. Yes, thank you. Um, obviously, the consultation mandate has been worked up um, along with the um, consultation gurus um, in the team. And uh, clearly, if members have got an appetite and would like to be involved at an earlier stage, there will be a programme of um, induction taking place, obviously, for the new council that I'm sure Mike and Tony will be um, making sure that members are aware of the work that is ongoing and so perhaps some conversation and dialogue about this particular topic could be built into that induction um, at the early stage. Obviously the timing of this straddles the, the new council coming in and uh, what would normally be the summer recess but we could certainly make sure that um, it's built in at that early stage of the discussion with the new council. I hope that's helpful. That's very helpful I would suggest. Jane are you happy with that? Yes, I am. I think that makes a lot of sense um, because there will be, I think, really a considerable amount of interest in this. And um, and the more that members are involved at the front end, I think the less problem you'll have at the back end. Couldn't agree more, Jane. Um, OK, so with that, and then Pauline and then Jackie. Hi, Mike. Hi, Tony. Thanks very much for all the communication and work on various roads issues recently. I just wanted to ask you, with regards to the car park, uh, which is next to the bazaar in Dumfries, just behind Barbers, I know that's been either bought out or sold to another company. And there's been a lot of disquiet across the region with regards to people turning up and not seeing the signage because it's so small. You have to use an app to pay for this particular car park and lots of constituents are getting caught out with a fine of £60, £100 and then a bad credit rating if they don't pay on time. Could you just clarify with me, is this part of the rollout as a trial at the moment or is this just part and parcel of what's happening with some of the car parks across the council at the moment? Just a bit of clarification would be great. Thanks very much, both of you. Um, Pauline, thanks. I'm, I'm, I'm just going to add to that for, for Mike or Tony. Um, can you clarify if that is a private car park or if it's a council loan car park? Thanks, Chair. I think the car park that uh, Councillor Drysdale's um, inferring is the one um, that used to be where the old market was on White Sands, which is a private car park. It, the, the council has no involvement in the management of that car park. OK, uh, Jackie, you have that... That answers your question, really, because uh, nothing, nothing flows from it. Uh, uh, Jack, Jackie, do you want to come in now? Uh, yes, please. Um, I must admit, my, my broadband is playing up as well, so I apologise if, if I drop out. It was just, Gordon, you're probably not um, surprised to see my name pop up in the, the chat, chat box. Um, you, Gordon, you've been really helpful um, lately about uh, disabled electric charge points for a specific location, but I just want to ask, um, is there consideration of disabled charging points as part of this process to roll it out um, 
just because there, there seems to be so few across the region. There's four or five. Now, I realise that there's work being done, um, which I appreciate immensely, um, to get more installed um, before March or um, by the time March comes tonight. But I just wondered um, what the policy is currently on that. Did you make that out, Gordon? Yeah, through, through yourself, Chair. I, th I think I caught the most of that. Um, so, as regards to policy, there's actually no, um, there's no guidance on the subject at the moment. Um, the, both the UK and Scottish governments um, are, are carrying out studies on that, and hopefully we'll see some guidance um, on the subject soon, but it's not there as of yet. So, what, what we've been doing um, is every project will carry out an element of due diligence, um, that that has involved our roads colleagues, um, and the one thing that we're, we're absolutely not doing is is reducing reducing the amount of disabled spaces, whether it be EV charging or, or normal spaces within the car parks. Um, it, it's quite the opposite. We're, we've actually got more than than the minimum requirement, um, and that that will be the case going forward. Um, that there, as far as far as I'm aware, for the projects that are live at the moment. Um, there's five across the region within different car parts. As you rightly say, that'll be 18 by the end of March, um, and that'll be considered in every project going going forward. Um, but we're definitely not in the game in reducing the, the, these spaces. We, we want to increase them to, to increase access and, and give everybody um, that fair chance at, at, at owning a, a transitioning into an electric vehicle. So ho hopefully that answers that. You okay with that, Jackie? Um, just if you don't mind, Chair, just a, another comment. Yeah, I understand that, and I don't want to cover all grounds, eh, Gordon, <laughs> for both our sakes. Um, but but yeah, it was it was you know in, in my particular ward there, there's there's one um, disabled space, so I, I would like to see that increase as the certainly as the the year goes on um, across the region in every ward. Uh, OK, uh, thanks. I think that's a statement, uh, Jackie, but thanks very much for that. Pauline, uh, apologies. Did I cut you off early? Were you trying to come back in? Sorry, I, I'm sounding slightly frustrated there, Chair. <laughs> I think it's just to say, it's, it's just unfortunate that we couldn't have done some kind of PR campaign on this parking situation before it was ch it changed hands and was either sold on or wh whatever the situation might be because the signage is absolutely dreadful and it's costing our constituents a heck of a lot of money but I appreciate it's not our problem as a council um, but if there was some way of doing some sort of communication through the Facebook pages just to warn people to make sure they download the app or park there then at least it's protecting us and they could per park elsewhere if they had that choice. Uh, an awful lot of people have been cut out, but I, I know you'll take these points on board. Thanks for letting me back in. OK, no problem. Um, I, I'm not seeing... Uh, thanks very much for that, Pauline. I don't think needs any comment now from officers for that. Uh, I'm ready to move to the recommendations. So are we happy to give recommendations 2.1 to 2.4? Agreed. Thank you. Um, We'll now move on to item number 11, Public Realm pro Capital Programme, um, Finance and Progress. Uh, it provides members with a financial and progress update for the projects and programmes contained within the 21-22 Public Realm Asset Class Capital Programme. Uh, can I just ask that we don't delve into individual um, sites, for example, if, if at all possible? Um, and if they need to discuss that, then officers can be deal with that directly with them on a one-to-one -one basis. Um, yeah, I think that would be helpful. I've got William Neal and uh, Mike Fox available through Teams, but I think James McLeod has got an update that he needs to give us. It's very only recently come in. James? Thank you, uh, Chair, uh, just through yourself. Um, I was just wanting to update on... Uh, sorry, I was just wanting to update on uh, item 3.31 uh, uh, and just read out the, the, the following. In in respect... Uh, sorry, I'm reading this, so I'm not looking at the camera. In respect to the update on the Lying on Flood Protection Scheme at 3.31, 
We've included a summary plan in Appendix 3 to illustrate the impacts of the defence heights with the removal of the overflow channel across the Baklu Park. Uh, very recently, uh, our consultants, uh, RPS, have advised that these levels were preliminary and now a further, more detailed review of the option without the overflow channel has been completed. A slight increase in the levels shown in Appendix 3 has been identified. Uh, to, to give members the fullest information, I can advise that the EIA will continue to be progressed on this option, but the increase in wall heights by removing the overflow, excuse me, by removing the overflow channel are as follows. Uh, if you're referring to uh, the plan in Appendix 3, loc location 1 should read 220 millimetres, not 160 millimetres. Location 2 should read 155 millimetres, not 100 millimetres. And location 3 should read an increase of 10 millimetres, not a decrease of 10 millimetres. We will, as the design team, continue to on the outline design of the without overflow channel option and we'll provide updated plans and information to elected members, the community council, and of course, these will always be uploaded to the project webpage uh, in the near future. Uh, I was just to provide that to you, Chair, and, and for members. Thanks very much, Jim. So, so basically, it's a, a slight increase in the height of the uh, a, 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 some of the walls that we're talking about here, and you're going to circulate that because it was a lot to take in. Um, so that will be circulated around members and the community council, so that everyone's aware of the re the change recommendation. Is that is that a, a reasonable synopsis of what you said? Yes, chair. That that's exactly right. We can uh, we can circulate with the minute uh, an updated plan showing the the change levels, and uh, uh, we can uh, add that text as well to the minute so that uh, all members are aware that that uh, there is a, a change. The the removal of the overflow channel effectively r raises the levels that we knew that would happen because the, the proposal to include it originally was to try and reduce the levels of the walls, and what we're saying is that 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 rise in levels is slightly higher. Than, uh, than was reported in the committee report papers. Thank you. Um, so, other than that, now we ready to go to questions. I see there's one hand up. I think it's Ronnie Tate, is it? Is, it, is that you, Ronnie? Yeah, it's me, Chair. Okay, um, on, on you come first, then, Jim Dempster. Okay, just a, just a question uh, with the theme of the 3.31 Langham Front Protection Scheme. Just for some clarity, because there's a lot of, you know, what could you say, disruption across at Langham on this scheme. Uh, my understanding is that the proposed scheme in Langham uh, has an estimated cost of approximately 9.9 .9 million. Now, there, there is a campaign group against a proposed flood protection scheme for Langham, and I do share some of their concerns, actually. Um, but the cost, they're, they're producing an estimated figure that the cost will be near as 75 million. And I repeat that, 75 million. And they're publishing this in the figures in the, the local press and Facebook. Um, you know, I think, you know, some of us, the, the, the members need some clarity on this because the campaign group will certainly be holding public meetings. So I think it's vital that we get some correct figures on these. I hope somebody can answer this. Um, <laughs> I'm not sure how we can deal with that today, but I think that's through, through the comms part of it. Um, we'll need to take that away under advisement, Ronnie, but I, I understand where you're coming from, because the, 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 the figures are so far apart, it's, uh, it, it's you know... Um, if it was a few, if it was yes, a million I mean, sorry, apart. Chair, but at the end of the day, actually, you know, we do we do need some honest debate on this. That's the problem. So, you know, I would like I would like some clarity on this, offline or whenever. But I, I really would like some clarity on these figures. Thank I, you. I, I think that's fair, and I can, we can raise for you because hey, there's budget creep and there's budget creep, isn't there? Um, I would suggest going for under ten million, to nearly eighty millions. Uh, a bit more than a creep. Um, so, Mike uh, uh, or James, are we able to get that kind of information uh, out there in the public, uh, public realm? You know, where the most recent updates are, because 
Will it be affected, for example, by the update we got from James earlier? Um, um, Chair, through yourself, uh, I mean, what I would say is that uh, I, I'm, I am, I think, more than more than surprised by the figure of 75 million uh, being being mooted for the scheme. Um, the the figures that we've pulled together are based on industry standard. Uh, and we can accept that yes, there will inevitably be increases in prices as as uh, as the years progress prior between design and construction because of inflation and and, and cost of and we've seen this across across the country with costs of of construction materials and and this report refers to that uh, in terms of roads schemes and and the like. But um, you know a sort of tenfold increase in in price of a a project of this nature, the level of design that we've taken. Uh, seems somewhat uh, somewhat unrealistic, um, but I mean we've provided as a as a service uh, we've provided a significant amount of information on how this scheme has been uh, taken forward with the community um, through a number of engagement events where community council have been involved, um, and we're we're more than happy to continue to to do that. Um, I am, uh, you know, slightly concerned in terms of the amount of information that we provided. You know, in in terms of responding to the objections that came in, uh, we provided all that information to members, to local members, to the onto the website, um, and and we can continue to do that. But um, the, it's the, this is the first I've picked up on the 75 million as a scheme cost. So more than happy to meet up with local members or all members. I take direction from from yourself, chair, from from my my managers and and the like, as to as to how you wish wish the team to to engage going forward. Um, thanks. Of course, there is a, a fact check uh, um, facility on Facebook, uh, uh, Ronnie, but uh, that's a separate thing. I, I, I think, in, in fairness to, to Ronnie, and Ronnie's right, you know, if, if we're getting this kind of running riot, um, uh, maybe riots are the wrong word for it, but, you know, uh, quoting figures that really. Uh, we're confident at this stage, if I'm picking you up correct, that, that we're we're using the industry standard calculators for inflation uh, to a project. Um, is, is that the case? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, chair. I mean, the, the costs that we're we're looking at. I mean, we've we've got a similar scheme um, at Newton Stewart, as you're aware. You know, a, a similar size of river, a similar sort of length of defence, a similar concepts of of walls and, and embankments where space is is, is available. A, a completely different consultant on that project, uh, and prices coming in and in and around the sort of you know eight to twelve million pounds. You know that that you know to then throw in a seventy five million seems um, seems not. Um, not realistic in 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 the view of a, you know, in in my view as a as a you know as a a, a chartered engineer with with many years experience in construction projects. Uh, yeah, I think that's where I was trying to get to, James. Um, a, I, I think we 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 kind of control what, or I wouldn't wish to control what people outside are doing, but um, I, I, I we can only we can only manage what's within our gift to manage. Um, so I think we'll need, there'll need to be some frank talking, I would suggest, in the Langham area, Ronnie, on um, the, the, the reasonableness of this estimate. Um, uh, so, but if James, yes. James and I are happy, if I'm picking this up right, to give us um, an updated cost, the most updated cost, using the industry standard tools, um, that, may, would, would, that would help at least counter some of it. Some of it. Yes, I think, Chair, if I, if I may come back here, I think we're quite willing to have a meeting with, with James and the flood prevention team and the elected members across in this area. Like, so that's fine. We'll arrange something, I'm quite sure. Yeah, thank so, you. Wait, wait, wait. OK, uh, Ronnie, thank you. So I've got Jim Dempster, Ian Blake and Ian Willie in that order. Um, Jim? Thanks, Chair. My question is on page 184-185. And it's about percentages, and I'm not going to lob in Sanker and Kirkconnell. I'm actually delighted and I'd like to thank Nicola. I see there's some progress in Sanker Cemetery. But it's about percentages. The, for example, the Kirkconnell Cemetery, 20k, 
committed three years ago, and we've got 15 percent of, of the work done. And it's about percentages, Chairman. What does that actually mean? Does that mean that we've committed the funding? Does that mean that we've assessed what's required? Does that mean that 15 percent of the work has actually been done? Because there is no any a, a, a text to tell us what the percentages actually mean. And now another thing, and, and it's it, it, there's probably a reason for it, and page 185, programmer works to make unstable headstones across the region safe. No percent, nothing done. And I'm sure that's certainly no right, given the discussions we've had earlier. So it's not a complaint, it's just an understanding, Chairman, of the, of the percentages eh, that are, are presented to members today. And I'll take up the local issues with, with Nicola offline. Thanks, Chair. OK. Who comes in? Uh, William, is it you? Yeah, through you, Chair. We um, report percentages from each of the programme leads. This is the first report that we've actually brought them in. And um, while we're, we're confident most of them are, are accurate, the individual percentages as part of the programme of works uh, could relate to design elements as well as on the ground works. So it is quite hard sometimes to compare apples with apples. Something like surface stress and percentage complete would be, yeah, it, it's what's on the ground. But as we say, where there is a design element or uh, the need to go out and engage external contractors, it may be 50% of that work is being done behind the scenes before the, the work's on the ground takes place. I see Karen has uh, appeared, so she may be able to answer that the second part of the question, which was the unsafe headstones. Yeah, we've Thank got, you, yeah, we've got Karen and Nicola on uh, there. Karen, do you want to take this first? Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, yes, uh, when I heard the, the, the question about un unsafe headstones, I thought I'd switch my camera on. Um, this report is up until uh, de December, and as members are aware, the, the headstone safety project across the increase in Galloway has halted, um, and we're in the process of restarting that. So SPEND will start to go through um, the capital programme now. OK, that's fine, and that'll be updated for the next committee. Well, next time it comes to committee, so that's fine. Um, Can I come back, Chair? Yep. Thanks, Chair. I, I just some of the money has been spent because sixteen cemeteries have been done, and I thought that uh, reflected in the percentage as well. But that's fine. No, I'm content with that. The, the, and it's not for today. Maybe the next time, though, if there's percentages, can we maybe be given some explanation as to what the percentage reflects? Because I understand exactly what William said, and and I understand that anyway that a percentage could mean a variety of things. But unless we actually see what each percentage means, it it, it, it doesn't help if, if, if you understand what I'm trying to say. Uh, in some cases, it will be 15% might be the, the funds committed, then it should say that. And if 15% is 15% of the work that has been done to complete the project, then it might say that. It's useful that it's there, but only if we get text uh, uh, to go with it to understand better what, 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 what they all mean. But uh, thanks for that, Chair. And again, thanks, Nicola, for the, the work done locally. Um, I, OK, Wally, I think this is a work in progress because this is emerging together of different reporting systems. If I'm, I, I see William's nodding. So... Um, I, it, it's a teething problem, I would suggest, and it can be sorted, so that's that's fine. Um, I'm now going to move on to Ian Blake. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, it's uh, in regard to paragraph 311 uh, about the DGRI mitigation works. I'm sure that you'll recall, if you go, we go back five years prior to the last election, that uh, you, myself, and Rob Beaver uh, that was certainly against this being introduced in the first place, but uh, and we had the public meeting to, to that effect. However, we are where we are as far as that's concerned. I see the delay has been put back to the tender process being uh, halted because of a, a low bid. In the interim period, in that five plus years, I think initially we were given the impression that this was going to be almost wholly funded by the NHS and then gradually over a period of time that got watered down and that we were eventually going to be making a substantial contribution to that. The price, the overall cost of this from 2016-17 to 2022-23 will have no doubt escalated considerably. 
So I'd like some indication. I know that there are obviously there'll be there are tender process going on, and there'll be some confidentiality in that. But I think I would like some indication of what the overall cost of this project is, and what our contribution is likely to be. The projected increase in traffic due to GRI really did not materialise because the preferred route would appear to be the A75. Uh, and, uh, you know, we're, we're speaking about value for money. I would just like to know the position as far as that's concerned. Thank you. OK, um, thanks, William. Can you come in? Through you, Chairman. Through you, Chairman. Just deciding who's the best person to answer that question and who may have the, the figures available. We're, we're having a little look around the room here at the moment. Can I make a suggestion, Ian, um, uh, Councillor Blake? This is pretty similar to the question that Andrew Wood asked earlier. Um, and rather than s s scratch about now, um, looking for it, can, can we get that as a briefing for members? Um, would that satisfy you, Ian? That seems reasonable. Thank you. OK, so that means we don't have to look for the answer right now, William. But if we can get that as a briefing for the committee and the ward members, I would suggest, for the, the two wards that are involved. Can we do that? Yep. Yeah. So, so, can I do mine? Yeah. yeah, we are going to bring in uh, Duncan from Engineering Chair, if that's OK. Thank you. OK, Duncan. Hello, Chair. Thank you. Through, uh, through you, and uh, in response to that, the, 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 the recent questions there, uh, I don't have the exact figure, but I know that the the the, the total spend it's it's a million pounds in that in that in that sort of range range uh, overall. Um, uh, the contribution from NHS um, was, my understanding, was primarily being um, given to the council. In terms of active travel uh, aims and objectives that they were seeking to to deliver, we for their own active travel uh, plan for the new hospital. Um, so uh, get, getting cyclists walking uh, or, or pedestrians through these junctions uh, was cited as part of a, a, a requirement for themselves. So in terms of delivering that 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 obligation, they they were uh, supporting the council with funding. Uh, along those lines, the scheme has expanded, as you've as you said yourself, over its lifetime, from being not not simply focused on one one T junction between Pleasance Avenue and New Abbey Road, but has expanded out to pick up the Park Road uh, New Abbey Road junction, which is, I'm sure most members will be aware, is quite a, a non-standard type layout and uh, is going to benefit from a, a more radical and sort of rational uh, realignment. Um, and then and bolted on to that again, we have um, crossing control crossing points for the community, which the community were really keen to have, particularly the one uh, near Park Road Junction uh, over to the shop. Uh, and there's also placemaking uh, uh, initiatives being in, uh, included in the project, uh, which has been um, supported and driven and funded, part funded by Sustrans themselves. Uh, maybe answer some of the questions raised. Yeah, I th think so. Th thanks, Duncan. Uh, I think uh, Ian Blake was quite happy to get a kind of uh, some sort of briefing um, for this committee and for the, uh, the ward members, that's Ward 5 and 6, um, uh, just exactly where we are with that junction at the moment uh, and what, you know, what the hold-up is and that kind of stuff and just uh, get it out there. So but thanks, thanks for that clarification and the work that's going on um, in the meantime. Uh, so can we get a briefing um, for members on the potential costs as they stand just now? Through you, Chair, yes, we should be able to uh, put together something relatively quickly and get that issued to all members. That's brilliant, yeah, because it can attach to the um, the minute of the meeting as well, if need be. Um, so that's uh, very helpful. Um, thanks very much for that. Uh, now, I've got another couple of speakers. Um, I've got Willie and then David Ingalls uh, at this moment in time. Willie? 
Yeah, Chair, uh, uh, and I do take note of what you said earlier, and so it's no particularly a specific issue, but I just want to draw attention, uh, the committee's attention to 3.35, and this is cost and effect uh, in terms of uh, recent adverse weather events in the west of the region. Uh, coastal infrastructure suffered damage at Tarali Bay, Kilstay, which is just uh, almost as you get into Dromore again. Uh, the, the cost and effect I want to draw your attention to is that each time, and it's becoming more uh, frequent, that there's a, a SEPA warning on Loose Bay, then uh, the road is closed, which we've already uh, discussed uh, on numerous occasions, but by doing so, we isolate about a dozen uh, households uh, in what they call the grinning. Uh, and why I'm taking note of what you say, I'm happy to take, you know, I have raised it with Derek as the director and Vlad as the, the head of uh, legal in terms of an alternative route for these people. Because when we isolate them, we isolate them from everything that's emergency service a lot and, and it just kind of continues to it. So I'm happy to take it offline with the director and uh, head of the legal chair. Uh, uh, okay, because I, I don't think there's anything for William and uh, or, uh, the empty answer right now for this. So it, it's noted what you're saying and there moves a foot because this has been long ongoing and um, the way the climate's going is going to get worse, right? It's not just there, right along the coast, um, but that one has been particularly bad over recent years. So uh, I think it's noted, the, the officers are both nodding, as I can see here, um, is that they're, they're acutely aware of it, and um, no doubt you'll take that forward, as you say, through through Derek and and, and, uh, and, and others. So thanks very much for that. Um, uh, David Ingalls? Thank you, Chair. Yeah, sorry, Chair. Yeah, page 155, item 3.33. It's regarding the core path banking along the River Cree. Just wondering if we can get a time scale on, on that. I see it's to be tied in with the flood protection works, but obviously this this is not going to wait for, for that length of time. I'm just hoping that this is going to be done during this summer and happy to take that answer offline if that's, if that's required. I, I think yeah, page, sorry. Sorry, I think that would be helpful, David, because it's a very specific yeah. one. Yeah. yeah, if we can do that. Have you got a second question? I have a second one, page 163. Um, again, it's it's probably specific. C27W, High Glen Link to Loch Edward, it's been cancelled. I could do with a uh, reason for that. I'm getting a lot of representation on that road, wondering what's happening with it. And the road's closed at the present moment in time. So if I can get a reason why that has been cancelled and what the plans are for that road. Again, happy to take that via email or offline. Thank you, Chair. OK, David, thanks very much for that. That's really helpful. Um, so no doubt if you speak to William or, or uh, Mike, uh, offline, they'll provide you all the thing. And again, once you've got that, could you make sure that all the ward members uh, are made aware of what the circumstances are? That'd be very helpful. Thank you. Um, do. I, I'm not seeing anybody else uh, want to speak now, so I'm ready to go to the recommendations. Are we uh, happy to agree 2.5 to 2.5? Thank you very much. Um, Moving quickly on, we've got the Capital Investment Strategy, Transport Asset Class Capital Programme. Report provides members with an update in relation to the outturn of the Transport Asset Programme for 2021-22 from, from April 2021 to the 31st of December last year, as detailed in the appendix. I've got Gordon Bryce uh, here and Mike is uh, still in line as well available through Teams to take any questions. Um, Gordon, have you got any, uh, any updates or are you happy going just straight to questions? Just two, two quick wee updates, if that's okay, Chair, thank you. Yeah, go um, ahead. It's, it's just to, to highlight a couple of typos within the, the report. Within 3.2, on the fourth paragraph, we, we talk about um, rouge buses, that should be rogue buses. And then within, um, within 3.6, on the third paragraph where we speak about the rail station parking, um, the design team dates should actually read between April 22 
in July 22 as opposed to March and June. But apart from that, happy to go to questions, Chair. Thank you. Um, fine, I was quite looking forward to seeing some red buses, uh, uh, Gordon, but um, never mind. Uh, so, uh, any questions for, uh, for Gordon in this? to see if anybody wants to come in. Um, doesn't seem to be. In that case, we'll move on to the, um, uh, the recommendations. And are we happy to agree the recommendations uh, 2.1 and 2.2? And 2 .2? Agreed. Thank you very much. Um, move on swiftly to item 13, which is the... Um, Surplus Property and the and Galloway Report by Head of Econ Economy and Development. The report has asked the members to agree that the two areas detailed within the report are surplus to the requirements of the Communities Directorate. Uh, we've got Andrew Maxwell available through Teams to take any questions on the report. I, I, any update, Andrew? Are you happy just going straight to questions? Yep, happy going straight to questions. Okay. Any questions for uh, uh, Adam? Adam first, then John, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Che cheers, Chair. Um, just one slight question, um, and, and only because of local knowledge on the property on Blacklock, well, the, the bit of land on Blacklock's Venal. Um, so the building is, if, as you're looking at that bit of land on the left-hand side, I'm not entirely sure who owns that. Um, I thought that it was the council, but I'm, I'm not entirely sure. But there is actually a fire exit that goes out onto... Um, this bit of land, and I was just wondering if that had been factored into this decision. Um, I'm yes, not entirely that's... sure if if the council owns it. I think we did, or we used to, but um, I'm not entirely sure. Just wonder if that had been factored in. Yeah, that's right. There's a fire exit from that building there. It's the former recreational hall. It's up for sale. The people have expressed an interest in acquiring that proper that neighbouring land as well. So joining the two together. And that's the reason for that. That's this is the reason for this report. Okay, with that, Adam. Yep, that answers that. Okay, I'm not seeing any other questions. For, uh, John, sorry, I beg your pardon. It's just Andrew. It's just on the piece of land at the Rochel Rochel Park. Has so we had somebody declare uh, someone express got had an expression interest in that piece of land. And if we declare yes. it, if we declare it surplus, surplus, will it be going on the open market? Yes, it'll be going on the open market uh, as in accordance with the disposal process. That's fine. Okay, that's uh, quick, quick answer, and, uh, quick, quickly uh, accepted. Uh, thanks very much. Anyone else? No. In that case, then we'll um, move to recommendations. Um, are we happy? To, well, are we happy to agree the recommendation? Uh, agreed. Thank you. Right. I've um, I've got one item of uh, urgent business as discussed at the beginning of the meeting. Um, I think we now need to break to come back on a different feed. Um, so we'll meet back here in five minutes and then. Take that Are we going to agree to exclude the public first and then? Well, that, that's what I thought, but it, it's in the different part of my um, thing. But, uh, so, are we agreeing under 14A, uh, adopting a resolution to exclude the public from the meeting in terms of section 50A, 4 and paragraph 6, 8 and 9 of part 1 of schedule 7A of Local Government Scotland Act 1973? We happy to agree yeah. that? Agreed. Thank you. So if we can all leave this uh, this channel and